I moved to this rundown cabin on the outskirts of Gatlinburg, Tennessee back in 2018. Figured it was a good place to finally write that book I'd been dreaming about since I was a kid, you know, the whole tortured artist thing. And maybe the mountain air would clear the last of that nasty L.A. smog out of my system. The place itself was just what you'd expect, drafty, creaky, with the added bonus of a family of raccoons that seemed to be having nightly raves in the attic. But hey, it was cheap and the views were amazing. Plus, after years of cramped, overpriced apartments, the isolation felt nice at first. A few months in, things started to feel off. I started hearing things at night. Footsteps outside the cabin, scratching sounds from the roof. At first, I chalked it up to the old house setting and maybe the occasional animal. But it just got worse. Sometimes I'd wake up to find things moved, a drawer slightly ajar or a book knocked off the shelf. Then there were the nights I swore I saw a flicker of movement just outside my window, but it was gone before I could be sure. One afternoon, I was hiking on the old mill trail, that winding path that snakes along the river. I loved that spot, always felt alone in the best way. But that day, I felt like I was being watched. It was a prickling feeling at the back of my neck. I kept turning expecting to see another hiker, but no one was there. I told myself I was being paranoid, jumping at shadows, letting the loneliness play with my head. But that gut feeling, the sense that somehow everything was tilted just a little bit off, stuck with me. It all came to a head about a week later. I was in town for groceries, getting my usual supplies at the dinky little market. The lady at the counter, Trudy, bless her heart, was a fountain of local gossip. You hear about that fellow they found out on Roaring Fork? She clucked as she bagged my sad-looking carrots. I shrugged. No, what happened? Her eyes widened. Poor fellow up and disappeared a while back. Sheriff went searching after a few weeks, found him finally. What was left of him, at least? Her voice dropped to a whisper. They say it was an animal attack. I felt those words settle in my stomach like a cold stone. Animal attack. I knew, I just knew, it wasn't that simple. Back at the cabin, the silence suddenly felt heavy. I started barricading the door at night, the window shades always drawn. I couldn't shake the feeling, the certainty, that he was out there watching me. Whoever he was. One night, I was working late. The words were finally flowing, the scene taking shape on the screen, some ironic twist, maybe, given what I was going through. Suddenly, I heard it loud and clear, a knock at the back door. My heart leaped into my throat. There was no one out there. No friends dropping in unannounced, Definitely not the mailman at this hour. Just dark woods teeming with. Who knew what? The knocking came again, slow and deliberate. It echoed through the silent cabin. I couldn't bring myself to go check. After what felt like an eternity, it stopped. And then he started whistling. A low, tuneless whistle that made my skin crawl. I stayed huddled at my desk not daring to turn, not daring to look out that window to see whoever was lurking in my backyard. Eventually, the whistling stopped. When I finally worked up the courage, hours later, to open the back door, there was nobody there. But I knew. He'd been toying with me. Things kept escalating. Stones thrown at my window at night. Tools going missing from the shed, showing up days later and always the footsteps circling the house. Sometimes I'd get brave, peek out a window, but never see him. He knew better, waited for me to fall asleep, for my guard to slip. I called the sheriff's office, explained the noises, 
the missing things, my fear. Deputy, whatever his name was, sounded bored on the other end of the line. Probably kids messing around, ma'am. Not much else out your way. Yeah, those local teens were real into playing creepy mind games with the weird lady living alone in the woods. I hung up, feeling stupid and, more than anything, scared. I bought a lock for the bedroom door. Slept with my grandpa's old hunting knife under the pillow, silly as it seemed. Then yesterday I found it. Scrawled in what looked like dirt on the side window. A single word. Run. That's when I knew something terrible was gonna happen. That knock on the door, those footsteps weren't just a threat anymore. They were a promise. I'm packing up my car now. Whatever that book was going to be, it ain't worth dying over. Gatlinburg never seemed quite right, but now I see I've only ever gotten half the picture. I just hope I'm getting out in time. I keep glancing in the rearview mirror, half expecting to see him standing at the edge of the woods. Long, lean figure dressed in faded denim, his face swallowed by shadow. Okay, so 81 it was. I had this beat-up old Camaro and a dream of hitting the big city, being the next Woodward or Bernstein. Instead, I got stuck in nowhere, Wyoming covering bake sales. My name's Wyatt, by the way, and I swear all of this is true, down to the last godforsaken detail. That summer was a scorcher, the kind of heat that makes your brain feel like scrambled eggs. My apartment was a furnace with a view of a dusty parking lot. Most nights, you could find me at May's Tavern, the only place in town with A.C. and semi-decent food. One of those nights, the boredom buzzing in my ears like a swarm of wasps, I got to talking with Pete, a trucker with hands like bare paws and a face weathered by a thousand miles. Wyoming, he grunted between bites of a greasy burger. Ain't got much to offer. Less folks follow the old I-80 these days. I tilted my beer in a half-hearted salute. Sure beats reporting on the town council's debate over hydrant colors. Pete let out a bark of laughter that nearly dislodged his toothpick. Now there's excitement, he said sarcastically. Then his face turned serious. But if you're looking for a real story, boy, you gotta head up north. Into the Wind Rivers. Turns out, there'd been a rash of disappearances. Hikers, mostly, vanishing without a trace in those mountains. Now, lost folks weren't exactly unheard of in that wilderness. But Pete said there was something off about these cases. He lowered his voice, like he was sharing a forbidden secret. They find their gear, see? Campsites untouched, not a sign of a struggle. Pete paused for dramatic effect. Like they just up and dissolved into thin air. I'd heard plenty of tall tales at that bar, but this one had the beginnings of a hook. Any theories? I asked, playing along. Some folks whisper about mountain lions, others about Bigfoot. He replied a glint of amusement in his eyes. But me? I think it might be something worse. That night, I dreamt of jagged peaks and howling winds, and a feeling of being watched that lingered even after I woke up. The seed was planted. A few days later, I tossed some supplies in my Camaro, told my editor I was chasing a lead on rogue cattle, and headed out. Figured I'd give it a week, poke around, and write some atmospheric piece about the mysteries of the mountains. Worst case scenario, I'd get some stunning photos out of it. I set up camp in a clearing near one of the trailheads, surrounded by a sea of pines that seemed to stretch on forever. The air had that crisp bite to it that meant fall was just around the corner, and the loneliness was so thick you could practically touch it. It was both scary and exhilarating, you know? 
like standing on a cliff edge, not knowing whether you'll fall or fly. Days went by, my notebook filling with descriptions of rustling leaves and birdsong instead of groundbreaking revelations. Turns out, investigating mysterious disappearances solo in the middle of bear country is mostly long hikes and an overactive imagination. Then, on the fourth morning, I found it, a campsite. Just like Pete described, ten neatly pitched, backpack lying open, everything in its place. No blood, no torn canvas, just nothing. Like someone had taken an eraser to a life mid-sketch. My pulse hammered in my temples, this was it. It had to be more than a coincidence. There was no trail of footprints, no obvious sign of where whoever had been here might have gone. Just a faint smell hanging in the air, something metallic and slightly sweet. I couldn't place it, but it prickled the hair on the back of my neck. By then, the sun was dipping behind the trees, casting long shadows that danced and morphed in the fading light. I had to get back to my car before it got pitch black out here, but morbid curiosity won out. Impulsively, I picked up that backpack heavy for supposedly being empty. I started rummaging through it. Sleeping bag, compass, half-eaten granola bar. Then, tucked in a side pocket, a crumpled photograph. A woman, young and smiling, standing on a mountaintop I didn't recognize. On the back, scrawled in shaky handwriting. Never coming back. My blood ran cold. I shoved the photo away, like it was a venomous spider. I zipped up the backpack, suddenly desperate to leave this place. Whatever was happening out here, I was poking my nose into something dangerous, something I didn't fully understand. As I turned to go, I saw him, standing stock still at the edge of the clearing, half hidden behind a gnarled pine tree. My breath caught in my throat. It was just a silhouette against the fading sunlight, but I could tell he was tall, built wide like an ox. Something about the way he stood, the stillness, radiated pure menace. My first thought was bare, but then I saw the glint of something in his hand, an axe, maybe, or a long hunting knife. It hit me, this was Pete's something worse, and he was watching me. It was 1972, and I'd just gotten my first reporting gig a small-town paper in the middle of nowhere, Kansas. Figured I'd pay my dues covering county fairs and zoning board meetings before I finally nabbed myself a spot in a real newsroom, you know, somewhere with a crime beat. Well, turns out, small towns have darkness hiding underneath those apple pie smiles, and I was about to walk right into it. I shared a crummy apartment above a laundromat with a girl named Sandy, a waitress with big dreams and a heart of gold. We weren't exactly best friends, but you find kinship where you can in situations like that. Plus, Sandy's knack for town gossip turned out to be a valuable source. Listen, Toby, she said over greasy burgers one night. I hear things over at the diner. Town ain't as picture-perfect as it makes out to be. It started out small, stuff I shrugged off at first. A missing dog, a break-in at the general store. Then there was old Mr. Harrison, swore up and down he'd seen someone lurking near his barn at night. Folks chuckled, put it down to old man ramblings. I was more concerned with nailing my story about the 4-H club goat judging results. Things changed when Ellie Mae Turner went missing. Ellie Mae was just seventeen, sweet as can be, the kind of girl who blushed when you asked for another cup of coffee. Suddenly she just wasn't there. No note, no runaway boyfriend, nothing. The sheriff organized a search party, but those Kansas fields stretch out forever. 
Even with a bunch of worried townsfolk, it felt like searching for a needle in a haystack. Something about it all sat wrong with me. I couldn't shake the feeling like we were all missing a piece of the puzzle. Sandy started sniffing around too, using her diner charm to get people talking. Turns out, several folks had seen a truck they didn't recognize hanging around Main Street. An old, beat-up Chevy, windows darkly tinted. Now, I wasn't a detective, but I had a reporter's hunch that something wasn't right. I started checking the neighboring towns, asking around diners, rundown motels, anywhere a stranger wouldn't stand out. Took me a couple of weeks, heart pounding in my chest as I pulled into a dusty gas station just outside of Abilene. There it was, that same Chevy. I ducked behind my rental car, pretending to fumble with the glove box. He got out, and my blood ran cold. Tall fella, broad-shouldered, but with a way of moving that seemed wrong. He wore a faded ball cap pulled low, and a bushy beard obscured most of his face. But something about the set of his jaw, the eyes that flickered over the parking lot like a cornered animal. I knew I'd found something. Problem was, I was in the middle of nowhere with my notepad and a half tank of gas. No backup, no cell service, and the sun was already starting to dip below the horizon. I cursed myself for not thinking this through, but I also couldn't just walk away. Ellie May's face flashed through my mind, and a stubborn sort of anger took hold. I got out of my car loud as you please to alert him to my presence. He noticed me right away, that animal alertness flaring up in his posture. Can I, can I help you with something? My voice sounded way shakier than I'd have liked. He didn't say anything, just stared. And that's when I saw the smear of something dark on the tailgate of his truck. It might have been mud, might have been rust. But what if it wasn't, just wondering, I said, trying to keep my voice steady. You, uh, you don't happen to have a spare tire, do you? Mine seems to have a flat. I made to move past him, to get a closer look at the truck bed. That's when he moved. It was just a step, blocking my way, but it was enough. His eyes were dark as storm clouds, a flicker of something dangerous swirling beneath the surface. I froze. Something told me this guy wasn't the helpful type. He wasn't the type to chat about the weather or offer to change a tire. He was the type to make a girl like Ellie Mae disappear into those endless Kansas fields. My reporter's notepad was in my bag, useless against the kind of threat radiating off him. I had to get out of there, had to get back to town and raise the alarm. Slowly, not wanting to provoke him, I started to back away. Nice try, sweetheart, he rasped. His voice was rough and used. But you ain't going nowhere. My heart jackrabbiting in my chest, I knew I didn't have time to play games. This guy was dangerous. I could feel it in my bones. But I couldn't just run, not without him knowing where I was headed. I had to buy myself some time. Look, I said, trying for a breezy tone that didn't quite come out right. I don't want any trouble. I'm just passing through, is all. He still didn't speak. Just stood there, sizing me up. But behind those cold eyes, I could see his mind worrying. I had to do something, anything. I'm a writer, see, I said holding up my notebook like it was some kind of shield. Always on the lookout for a story. You, uh, you just seem like an interesting guy. His bushy eyebrows arched, a flicker of something. Was it amusement? In his eyes. Maybe I'd struck a nerve. A writer, huh? He finally spoke, his voice a low rumble. And what kind of story you think you'll find around here? I took a shaky breath. His question was a trap, but it might be my only chance. 
Well, I'm interested in true stories. You ever hear of that Ellie Mae case, the missing girl? I watched his face carefully. A muscle in his jaw twitched, the only outward sign that I'd hit my mark. No reason for a pretty thing like you to be poking around stuff like that. His voice was laced with a veiled threat. My mind raced. I had his attention, but I was dancing on a knife's edge. One wrong move and I'd be the next story, my headline lost in the endless expanse of Kansas. You might be surprised, I countered, forcing a lightness I didn't feel. Small towns have more going on than meets the eye. Maybe you know something nobody else does. He stood motionless for a long, drawn-out moment. Just when I thought he'd call my bluff, that he'd lunge for me, he did something far more unsettling. He laughed. It was a dry, raspy sound that echoed in the stillness of the parking lot. He took a step closer, the smell of stale sweat and something metallic making my stomach churn. Maybe I do, sweetheart, he said, and you've stumbled onto something real big, maybe bigger than you can handle. The sun was a fiery streak on the horizon now, casting long shadows that stretched out like skeletal fingers. That image stuck with me. I felt like the shadows were creeping closer, ready to consume me. I was running out of options. Had to make my move and hope to God it was the right one. Keeping my voice as even as possible, I said, Well, I appreciate it. And I know people, people who would be very interested in what you have to say. I let the threat hang unspoken in the air between us. This guy probably wasn't the type to tangle with the FBI, but maybe just the hint of a bigger force would make him think twice. He stared at me for a long moment, weighing me up. Finally, he snorted. Ain't afraid of your friends, honey. Nobody's coming to save you out here. That's when I saw it. Pure, primal fear flashed across his face before he could mask it. He glanced over my shoulder his gaze darting toward the highway. I didn't have time to think. I bolted from my car, fumbling the keys with shaking hands. I heard him yell something, a growl of fury, and his heavy footsteps pounding on the pavement behind me. I got the car started just as he reached for the door handle. He wrenched it, spit flying from his lips as he swore. The tires screeched as I peeled out of there, a cloud of dust in my wake. I didn't stop driving for miles, heart thundering so loud it drowned out the roar of the engine. Eventually, when my breath started to come in shuddery gasps instead of sobs, I pulled over. It was full dark by then, the lonely expanse of the highway lit only by my headlights. That's when the full weight of it hit me. That man had been ready to hurt me, to kill me even. I'd barely escaped. And what about Ellie Mae? I felt sick to my stomach. I'd gone out looking for a story, and I'd found pure evil. I made it back to my crummy apartment. Sandy was waiting up, a worried crease between her brows. When I told her what happened, her eyes widened like saucers. It turned out those rumors she'd been hearing connected the Chevy to other missing persons reports from neighboring states. Girls my age vanished without a trace. I called the sheriff, but he sounded about as enthusiastic as a guy getting a root canal. A few days later, I packed my bags. That small-town newspaper gig didn't seem so appealing anymore. The face of that man, his coldness was seared into my brain. I left before dawn, never looking back. Never found out for sure if he was the guy they called the Heartland Harvester, a name whispered on the news years later when they found those bodies buried in a field just like the ones outside Abilene. I just knew that evil walks among us sometimes, and I got lucky that day.
Okay, here we go. It's 1953, and I find myself stuck in this crummy motel room on the edge of Tucson, Arizona. You probably think, Arizona? Shouldn't it be all sunshine and desert scenes? Well, you wouldn't be far off, unless it's monsoon season like it is currently. Rains hammering on the roof like a thousand angry squirrels. My name's Miles, Miles Davis. I'm a traveling salesman, or was, until about ten minutes ago. See, I just got myself fired. It wasn't exactly my fault. Well, not entirely. All right, maybe it kinda sorta was, but cut a guy some slack, will you? My boss, old man Harvey, is tight with his money. Thinks fancy dinners with clients are a waste. But you try selling industrial mixers or whatever when all you can offer is a lukewarm cup of gas station coffee. This last town, this Norrisville place I'm holed up in, I figured a decent meal could only help seal the deal. Took a potential client out to a real steakhouse, the one with sawdust on the floor and a taxidermied bear in the corner. The guy, big fella named Hank, loved it. Two porterhouses and several beers later, I'm sure we're golden. Then it turned out Hank left his wallet in his other pants. He slapped me on the back, promised to wire the money first thing next week, and stumbled off into the rain. I ended up footing the bill. Well, let's just say Harvey wasn't pleased when I called. Now, here I am watching the rain paint streaks down the grimy window pane, wondering how I'm going to pay next month's rent on my tiny apartment back in Phoenix. The motel's not much. Thin walls, flickering neon sign outside, and a bed that probably dates back to the Hoover administration. The only thing in my favor is that the rain is drumming so loud, it drowns out the usual squeaking springs and muffled arguments from the rooms next door. Just when I convince myself that sleep is out of the question, that's when it starts. A rapping at my door. Soft, insistent. Not the knuckles on wood of a regular visitor. I get up, my heart doing a little jitterbug in my chest. This isn't the sort of place that sees room service, especially not past midnight with a storm raging outside. I leave the chain on and peek through the gap. The porch outside is empty, the rain slashing down in that way that makes it look more like a wall of water than individual drops. Hello? My voice comes out hoarse, scratchy. Nothing. But I swear, there's the ghost of a shadow, just at the edge of the light cast by the flickering neon sign. Maybe it was Hank, drunk and regretting his missing wallet. Maybe my mind's playing tricks on me. Either way, I'm not about to go swinging the door wide open. If you're selling something, I'm not buying. I yell through the door. The rain hammers in reply. Then, a voice, low and raspy, right outside my door. Just open up, it says. It's a man, that much I'm sure of. His voice sends a shiver down my spine. Not fear, exactly, more like the feeling of stepping into a pool that's way colder than you thought it would be. Can't help you, I say. Look, whatever this is, come back in the morning. The door rattles, the chain straining. My breath catches. I didn't close it properly. But the rattling stops as quickly as it began. Come out, the voice says, even quieter than before like he's right up against the wood, whispering on the other side of the door. He doesn't ask, he doesn't threaten, just repeats that one phrase. It sounds so strange, so wrong, that it's almost hypnotic. My hand reaches toward the latch before my brain can catch up. Then, something shifts outside. The light coming through the gap under the door changes and I snatch my hand back like I've been burned. A shadow falls across that narrow strip of light. It's long, too long to be right, like it's stretched out on the porch. 
My hands start shaking so bad I can barely keep my grip on the door. I'm not a religious guy, but all the half-remembered prayers my folks used to say start bubbling up from some dark corner of my brain. Then the shadow recedes. The rapping starts up again, slow and steady. I back away from the door, my eyes glued to that sliver of light. One rap. Two. Three. Four. My fingers find the bedside lamp. I fumble for the switch, and the room floods with sickly yellow light, chasing away the shadows. There's nothing but the rain, pounding down, and the flicker of the neon sign. I stay like that for the rest of the night, huddled in the armchair farthest from the door, clutching that stupid lamp like a lifeline. The rain finally stops just before dawn, the motel sign buzzing in the sudden silence. I pack my bag with swift jerky movements, eyes darting around the room. Whatever was at the door, man or monster, it's gone, but I'm not sticking around to find out. As I'm checking out, the clerk, a skinny guy who looks like he hasn't slept in a week, gives me an odd look. Rough night? he asks, scratching at a stubbled chin. You could say that. I manage to mumble, tossing my keys on the counter and not looking back. As I drive out of that town, the sun starting to peek over the saguaros, I try to convince myself it was just a nightmare. Too much cheap bourbon and a side effect of the stress. I check the rearview mirror every few minutes, but all I see is the long stretch of highway and the clear, empty sky. But as I get back on the road, a thought keeps circling my mind like a vulture. I never saw the guy at the door. Never got a glimpse of his face. He could have been tall or short, young or old. Under the cover of darkness and the pouring rain, he could have looked like anyone or anything. I glance in the rearview mirror again. And though I see nothing but the road fading away behind me, I swear in that moment there's a flicker of something in the glass. A hand with too many fingers waving goodbye. Okay, so it's 1959. I'm a door to door vacuum salesman. Yeah. I know, not the most exciting job. But hey, someone's got to do it, right? My name's Doug. Doug Carter. Right now, I'm sweating like a pig in this godforsaken desert town in Nevada. This place is so small and dusty, the tumbleweeds look kind of fancy in comparison. The whole town seems deserted, except for one lone bar perched on the edge of the highway. It's got a flickering neon sign and a name so cheesy it makes my teeth ache. The Rusty Spur. Well, desperate times call for desperate measures. I figure, a cold beer and maybe a tip from the bartender might make this whole day a little more bearable. I push open the heavy wooden door and step inside. The place smells of stale beer and something, musky. It's dim the only light coming from behind the bar where a beefy guy in a stained apron is polishing a glass. Can I help you? He says, not looking up. Beer, please. I slide onto a bar stool, the worn leather creaking in protest. And hey, you know anyone in this town needing a top-of-the-line vacuum? He grunts and sets down a foamy glass. Nope. Town's quiet. Most folks here, they still use brooms. I take a long swig of beer, trying to ignore the sinking feeling in my stomach. Well, if you hear of anything. I trail off, gesturing vaguely with my half-empty glass. Sure, sure, he mutters, already turning away. I down the rest of my beer, trying to work up the energy for one last block of door knocking before I call it a night. As I'm paying, I hear a rustle from the back of the bar, like someone shifting in a darkened booth. I glance over, 
but it's too dark to see anything clearly. You might want to get a move on, the bartender says, jerking his thumb towards the window. The sky outside has turned an ominous shade of purple, storm clouds gathering on the horizon. Weather can turn nasty out here real quick. Before I can get a word out, the bar door swings open and a gust of cold wind whips through the room, carrying the scent of rain and sand. A figure steps inside, dripping wet and hunched against the sudden downpour. He's big, broad-shouldered, and wearing a dark overcoat and a beat-up fedora hat pulled low over his face. The bartender gives the man a curt nod as he heads toward the back of the bar near the darkened booths where I thought I saw movement earlier. I tried to casually sneak a look at the newcomer, but the hat hides most of his features. Something about him gives me the creeps, like a bad feeling prickling at the back of my neck. I finish paying and turn to leave, eager to get out of the stuffy bar and find shelter somewhere before the storm really hits. Just as I reach the door, a woman screams, it's high-pitched and cuts through the air like a knife, sending a shiver down my spine. The bartender drops the glass he's polishing, and it shatters on the floor. What the hell? he shouts, moving toward the back of the bar. My hesitation lasts only a second, then I'm following him, every instinct screaming at me to get out of there, but too damn curious to listen. What we find in the back room makes my blood run cold. Slumped on the floor is a woman. Young, with a mess of blonde hair and a torn waitress uniform. There's blood everywhere. On the walls, on the table, and soaking into the threadbare carpet. In the dim light, her eyes seem to stare straight at me, wide with terror. And behind her, the man in the fedora is standing in the shadows, one hand clutching something dark and gleaming. The bartender takes one look at the scene and vomits all over the floor. The man in the fedora whirls around. For a split second, I see his eyes flash in the light, not human eyes, but a deep, oily black. Then, he lunges forward, moving with a speed that doesn't seem possible for someone his size. The bartender tries to scramble backward, but the man is on him in a blur of motion. I don't think I just react. I grab a busted bar stool and heave it with all my might, aiming for the man's back. It connects with a sickening thud, and he stumbles forward, giving the bartender a precious few seconds to scramble out of reach. The man whirls back towards me, that horrible oily glare in his eyes. I raise the broken stool leg, ready for another swing, but I swear he smiles, like this is all some kind of sick game to him. He doesn't give me the chance to find out. He moves, just like before, a blur of darkness and violence. There's a searing pain in my shoulder, a wet tearing sound, and then my arm's not working right, hanging useless at my side. I stagger backward stumbling over the woman's body. The world is tilting, spinning around me. The man in the hat advances, slow now, savoring the moment. I try to crawl back, but there's nowhere to go, I'm trapped against the wall. He raises that black, gleaming thing. It isn't a knife, it's long and curved, like a talon, dripping with something thick and red. I squeeze my eyes shut, not wanting to see the final blow. But instead of pain, there's a scream that cuts through the air, a scream not my own. My eyes snap open. The man in the fedora is doubled over, clutching at his face. Smoke or steam rises from his hand. He lets out another bellow of rage and pain, then whirls and bolts for the back exit, smashing through the flimsy wooden door. The bar smells like blood and something acrid. I manage to get unsteadily to my feet, the room swimming around me. The bartender's still on the floor, curled into a ball and sobbing. My shoulder throbs, a hot, wet mess. 
Hey, buddy, you okay? I crouch down beside him. He peeks out from behind shaking hands, his face streaked with tears and vomit. When he speaks, his voice is barely a whisper. It was him. It was finally him. Who? I ask more to distract him than because I expect an answer. He starts to babble, something about a drifter, a devil, stories from other towns going back years. Towns where people disappeared or were found torn to pieces in back alleys. I get the gist. Everyone in this godforsaken corner of the world knows something, and I've stumbled into the middle of their worst nightmare. The front door is still swinging slightly where the killer, the drifter, whatever the hell he was, made his escape. Thunder rumbles in the distance, but the rain seems to have stopped. I have to get out of here, get to a hospital. Can you stand? I ask the bartender, but my voice sounds distant, even to my own ears. I somehow manage to pull the bartender to his feet. He sways on the spot, clutching his stomach, and it takes both of us to stagger over to the front door. That's when I see it, a single word scrawled in what looks like blood on the dusty floorboards. Crow. Outside, the air feels thick and heavy, pressing down on me. My truck is only a few yards away, but it might as well be a mile-long hike. The world seems to tilt sideways each time I put weight on my injured shoulder. I don't know how much blood I've lost, but I'm getting weaker by the second. The bartender stumbles and slumps against the side of my truck, retching again. Get in. I manage to mumble, shoving the keys into his trembling hands. He fumbles with the door handle, and I slide into the passenger seat, my vision tunneling. Through the grime-streaked window, I see the lights of the rusty spur fading in the distance, the scene of a horror story I never wanted to be a part of. The doctors at the nearest hospital patched me up as best they could. Lost a lot of blood, they said, and some serious muscle damage, but I'd live. The cops showed up too, of course. They took my statement, asked a million questions, poked and prodded around the crime scene. But by the time I was released a few days later, they seemed no closer to catching the guy. News traveled fast in this part of the world. I heard whispers, snippets of stories from people in the next town over, and the one after that. All about missing people, grisly murders, and a name muttered in hushed tones. Crow. Seems that devil in a fedora coat had been leaving a bloody trail across the desert for years. And now, I was part of it. They never caught him, that much I know. I spent many a sleepless night after that, watching the shadows dance and my bedroom door creak open, waiting for those oily black eyes to appear in the darkness. He became my boogeyman a symbol of the evil that can lurk in the hearts of men dressed in ordinary clothes. My shoulder healed, as best as it could, always a bit stiff, a permanent reminder. I quit my job selling vacuums, drifted for a while. Worked odd jobs, tried not to think too much about the past. And I never, ever stopped in any small-town bars with names that made your teeth itch no matter how desperate I got for a beer or a hot meal. Some nights, when the wind whistles through a crack in the window just so, and my old scar burns like a hot coal, I think I hear a whisper. Faint carried on the breeze, but I swear it says one word. Crow. Maybe it's all in my head. Maybe it was just some homicidal maniac with a weird way of leaving his mark. Or perhaps there's some truth to the old wives' tales they whispered through those desert towns. Sometimes the monsters are real, and they walk among us, just waiting for the right moment to strike. All right, hold on to your hats. This gets wild. 
It's 2018 and I'm in New Orleans. Call me Marcus Marcus Bell. I ain't the superstitious sort, but this city's got a vibe that gets under your skin. Especially at night in the French Quarter, with the shadows dancing and the echo of jazz drifting from some shadowed balcony. I'm a freelance photographer, the kind who scrapes by chasing down weird stories and urban legends. So, New Orleans? Perfect place to dig up something lucrative and spooky. Tonight, I'm chasing a lead on the Carter House haunting. Some old mansion on the outskirts of town, supposedly filled with restless spirits. The usual stuff, cold spots, flickering lights, the works. Owner wants to sell, but nobody will touch the place with a ten-foot pole. He figures if I can get some juicy photos of real ghosts, he can drum up the right kind of attention. I get to this Carter place around midnight, and damn if it doesn't give me the willies. Classic, overgrown, southern gothic. Looks like something out of an and rice novel, all crumbling white columns and moss-covered statues. It takes some wrestling to get the old rusted gate open, and then I'm creeping along a gravel path toward the house. The moon is full and bright, casting weird splotches of light through the overgrown trees. Every snap of a twig underfoot sounds like a gunshot. Finally, I reach the porch. One look at the front door tells me it hasn't been opened in decades. Guess I'm going in the less traditional way. It takes a few minutes, but I spot a window on the side of the house that gives with a satisfying creak. I wriggle my way in, flashlight beams slicing through the dusty air of the grand entrance hall. The place is frozen in time. Faded velvet drapes, an enormous crystal chandelier dripping cobwebs, paintings of grim-looking folks in old-fashioned clothes staring at me from darkened canvases. I take some shots, trying to capture the crumbling grandeur, but there's nothing obviously, ghostly, yet. That's when I hear it. A low moan from somewhere upstairs. And not like the wind whistling through a crack. This is something else, a human voice, laced with pain. My heart skips a beat. Could it be a squatter? I switch off my flashlight relying on the faint moonlight for guidance. My footsteps squeak a little on the worn wooden floorboards as I make my way towards a sweeping staircase that leads to the second floor. The moaning grows louder, more urgent. Seems to be coming from the far end of a dimly lit hallway. I reach a door, slightly ajar. That's where the sounds, the sobbing, is loudest. I take a deep breath and push the door further open. At first, I think the room might be empty. It's massive, draped in more of that dusty fabric, with tattered curtains barely concealing the moonlit windows. But then my eyes land on a four-poster bed in the center of the room, and someone's sitting on it. A woman, hunched over, her face buried in her hands. She's shaking and the air thrums with distress. Hey, uh, you okay? Ma'am? My voice comes out more like a croak. She doesn't even flinch at the sound. It's like she doesn't hear me. I get closer, my curiosity outweighing my better judgment. Something about her dress seems off, like it's really old-fashioned. And the way she's hunched over, even in the shadows... Her posture seems wrong. When I'm just a few steps from the bed, the woman abruptly stops sobbing. She slowly lifts her head. The moonlight falls full on her face, and all the breath whooshes out of my lungs. Her skin is pale, almost translucent. Her eyes, my God, her eyes are wide and sunken, and an unnatural shade of deep violet. She opens her mouth and lets out a piercing shriek. No words, just a raw, inhuman sound. It's a scream that seems to come from something older, more primal than any person should be able to produce. I stumble back, heart pounding, 
bumping into an antique dresser. Something crashes to the floor. A mirror, I think. The screaming stops. I turn and run. I don't look back, just tear through the mansion, tripping over furniture, clawing at doors until I find one that leads outside. My lungs are on fire by the time I burst back into the muddy night, the echo of that chilling shriek still ringing in my ears. I don't stop running until I reach the rusted gate, shoving it open so hard it clangs off its hinges. And I swear, as I sprint down that gravel path, under the skeletal branches, and towards the flickering lights of the quarter, I hear a rustle of movement somewhere behind me. I never went back to the Carter house. The owner never got his ghost photos, and for all I know, that place is still rotting away with its secrets. Sometimes I think I should call someone, the cops or some supernatural investigators. But who would believe me? Besides that house, that thing in the bedroom, that's not some harmless spirit. It was something dark, older than dirt, masquerading as a woman. That night changed me. Made me see the shadows lurking at the edge of our world, the ones we try so damn hard to ignore. Nowadays, when some folks tell me their ghost story, the hair stands up on the back of my neck. Because I know, deep down, they ain't seen nothing yet. All right, check this out. It was back in 2021. I was living in a little cabin just off the Appalachian Trail, up in Tennessee. I'm a hiker through and through. Ethan, Ethan Pierce, that's me. Love the outdoors, the solitude of long trails, just me, my pack, and the sound of the forest. Now, I'd heard the rumors about these mountains. Trail lore about moonshiners hiding out in the woods, old recluses, and missing hikers whose cases went cold as ice. You learn to brush off those tall tales. Gotta, if you want to keep your wits about you out there. This particular hike, I was doing a three-day loop, planning to camp in some shelters along the way. First day was a breeze, weather perfect, trail in good shape. I make great time and end up pulling into the first shelter way earlier than I planned. Now, these shelters are basic, just a wooden platform, raised roof, three walls to give you a little protection from the elements. This one's empty when I get there. Perfect. I ditch my pack, make a quick dinner over my camp stove, do some stretches to work out the kinks. Just as the sun starts to sink, Dipping the whole forest in this fiery orange glow, I hear something. A twig snapping. At first, I assume it's a deer or something. But then there's another snap, closer. And it doesn't sound like any animal I recognize. I freeze, every muscle tight as a bowstring. That's when I see him. A man steps out from the trees just on the edge of the clearing. Tall guy but hunched over like he's trying to make himself smaller. Dressed in rags, I mean his clothes looked more like torn-up burlap sacks than a proper outfit. He was all scraggly, beard down to his chest, stringy hair that looks like it hadn't been washed in a year. And his eyes, there's something off about them, too bright, almost glowing in the twilight. Evening, he says in a raspy voice. I try to answer, to seem casual, but my voice croaks out a pathetic. Hi. He takes a few quiet steps into the clearing, eyes never leaving me. There's something wrong with the way he moves, jerky and uncoordinated, and the closer he gets, the worse it smells. Like rotting meat and something earthy and sour underneath. I can't place it. You alone? He asks tilting his head to one side like a curious bird. Yeah, just me, I managed to say. My hand instinctively goes for the folding knife in my pocket, but I don't open it, 
Don't want to escalate anything just yet. Good. Good, he croaks, and takes another step closer. That's when it hit me what that smell was, blood and rust mixed with dirt. Look, hey, I'm just passing through. This shelter's open to anyone. You can stay here. I don't mind. I stammer, trying to sound calm, but my heart is doing a tap dance in my chest. This guy's sending off every alarm bell in my head. He stops, just a few yards away. Up close, I see how gaunt his face is, skin pulled tight over his cheekbones. He smiles then, and it's not a normal smile. It stretches across his face, too wide, and shows way too many teeth. Filthy, pointed teeth. That's when I know I'm in deep trouble. This ain't no lost hiker or crazy recluse. This is something else. Ain't staying, he says, his voice low and rumbling. And he lunges. I don't have time to think. I'm all instinct. I roll off the shelter platform, scrambling on hands and knees, and snatch up a fallen branch from the ground. He lands where I was a second ago, those claws that pass for hands tearing at the wood. He snarls, a guttural, animalistic sound that sends shivers down my spine. I'm on my feet, backing away. The flimsy branch suddenly feels pathetic in my hand, but it's better than nothing. He leaps at me again, and I swing the branch wildly, catching him across the face. It throws him off his stride. He roars in fury, and stumbles backward. That's my cue. I drop the branch and tear off into the dense woods, branches whipping at my face, not caring about my pack or any of the gear I left back at the shelter. Just run. I can hear him crashing through the undergrowth behind me, those horrible snarls growing closer. I have no idea where I'm going, just pure blind panic fueling my legs. Then, as quickly as it started, a new sound cuts through the night. A car horn blasting out from the valley below. He stops dead in his tracks, his snarls turning to whimpers, like a dog caught doing something bad. I keep running for a long time after that, stumbling through the trees, gasping for breath. Somehow, I make it back to the main trail just as the first hints of dawn start to paint the sky. I see a group of early morning hikers coming up the path, and I almost weep with relief. They must have seen how panicked and disheveled I was, cause they start asking me a ton of questions. Before I know it, I've spilled the whole beans. I know how crazy it sounds. Most people wouldn't believe it, honestly, after a while, I started to doubt it myself. But they never found my stuff at the shelter and some of the park rangers swore they saw tracks that didn't belong to any known animal. I spend the rest of that day stumbling along with the hikers, answering questions in a daze, getting patched up at the ranger station. I make up some story about getting attacked by a wild animal, because honestly, who would believe the truth? Turns out they had a missing person report from a week earlier, solo hiker, same area I was in. They went out searching, but never found a trace of him. I ended up going home, ditching the rest of my trip. For weeks I couldn't shake that feeling of being watched, like if I stepped into any place with trees, he'd be lurking there, waiting for me. I started carrying a bigger knife on my hikes, jumping at every sound. I thought maybe I should see a therapist or something, but what would I even say? Couldn't let it ruin my life though, right? So a few months later, I forced myself to get back out there. Figured best way to face down your fears was head on. This time I chose a well-trafficked trail, stayed close to campgrounds, never stayed out after dark. Took every precaution to feel safe, but that gnawing dread never left. Each time I thought I saw a flash of movement in the trees, heard a twig snap when there was no wind, 
that primal fear would spike in my gut all over again. Then, about a year later, I'm at this outdoor gear store, browsing hiking boots. There's a stack of old local newspapers by the counter, and bored, I start idly flipping through them. You know how sometimes you stumble on something that chills you to the bone? Well, that was this. A small article, buried way in the back pages. Headline, Hiker Found Dead in National Forest. They found the body of that missing guy from when I was attacked. It was near that first shelter, partially concealed under some brush. They said it looked like an animal attack, flesh torn off, all kinds of gruesome details. But here's the thing that made my blood run cold. The date they estimated for his time of death was the day before I was at that shelter. Meaning, he could have still been alive when I rolled through, maybe hiding from that, that creature or freshly dead. If I had arrived just a few hours later, I left that store feeling sick to my stomach. Because here's the thing, everyone, the cops, the park rangers, they think he's just another unlucky hiker who fell victim to a bear or a mountain lion. But I know better. I know there's things hiding out there, things that ain't natural, things that prey on people. I still hike, but now, even on sunny days on a busy trail, I can't shake the feeling I'm not alone. That I'm being watched by hungry eyes. I started looking at old missing persons cases from that area, cases that got dismissed as animal attacks and freak accidents. Started seeing patterns, similarities that made me think maybe, just maybe, there's more than one out there. And it's not just the fear of being hunted myself, it's the knowledge that other people are disappearing into those woods, likely being torn apart by those inhuman claws without anyone ever catching a clue about the real danger out there. Sometimes I dream about that night in the shelter, the snarling face, the gleaming eyes. In my dreams, I see his name carved into the wooden wall, a desperate plea for the world to know what stalled him, Cody. You won't find any news reports with that name. There's no record, no official confirmation of what's lurking in those hills. Just an old local story, a hiker's tall tale. But I know different now. Out there, in the shadows of the deep woods, the truth hides and it hungers. It was 1978. I lived in this tiny little town along the California coast, nowhere you'd ever actually want to visit, a pit stop for tourists on their way down the Pacific Coast Highway. I was working as a night watchman for this old warehouse complex down by the docks. Kinda creepy job, but the pay was enough to keep me in beer and smokes, which was all that really mattered back then. My name's Caleb, by the way. This particular night, the usual crowd was filtering out of Murphy's Pub across the street. Sailors, fishermen, locals. Just another foggy Tuesday. I was halfway through a truly terrible paperback and trying to stay awake when I heard it. Faint at first, like a scratching sound from somewhere along the docks. Seagulls, probably, or some drunk passed out behind a crate. The scratching gets a little louder, a little closer. Now a sense of dread starts creeping in. This place always gave me the willies, especially at night. The whole complex is built on these ancient piers. You can hear the tide shifting beneath the floorboards even when it's dead calm outside. I finally look up from my book. Hey, is anyone out there? Silence. I get that little tingle of adrenaline you always hear people talk about. You know, the one that tells you something is very wrong? Okay, maybe I should call it a night, go back to Murphy's and try not to think about the empty warehouses and the dark water lapping beneath me. I'm halfway to the door when I hear it again. Definitely scratching 
and something heavy being dragged along the floor. It's closer this time, maybe halfway down one of the aisles. Who's there? My voice sounds shaky, pisses me off. I start walking towards the sound, which might be dumb, but fear and curiosity have never been a good mix in me. The owls are stacked to the ceiling with boxes, old machinery, who knows what. It's pitch black, my flashlight only cuts a slice through the gloom, and the scratching is louder. My breath catches in my throat because it smells awful in here. Wet and rotten and a little coppery, like blood. Then I see it. Up ahead, a flicker of movement where the end of the aisle meets the docks. It's big, not human-shaped. I think I might throw up. My brain starts fumbling for explanations. Sea lion, maybe? They get confused sometimes, end up in weird places. But this thing, too big, too dark. And I swear, under my flashlight beam, I see a glint of eyes way too high off the ground. Whatever it is, it's turned away from me, making this low, guttural growling sound as it paws at something on the ground. I edge closer, the coppery stink making my stomach turn. That's when I see what it's hunched over, dragging across the floor. A body. A chill goes through me like I just walked into a freezer. It's a guy in a sailor's uniform. And his throat, his throat's gone, ripped clean open. Blood everywhere. That snaps me out of my shock. I pivot and run, shoving boxes out of the way, my flashlight beam jittering like crazy. Panic makes me clumsy. I trip over something, hit the floor hard. I scramble up, hear thudding footsteps behind me. It's coming. I burst out of the aisle, almost run straight smack into the wall. I whirl, trying to find another way out, any way out, but there's just the endless stacks of stuff in the gloom. I'm trapped. The heavy, dragging footsteps are right behind me now. I can hear it breathing, harsh, wet rasps. Then a flash of pain jolts through my arm. I cry out, see I'm bleeding. It caught me with a swipe of its claws. I duck into another aisle just as it rounds the corner, massive and misshapen in the shadows. It sniffs the air, hesitates, then begins to prowl closer, those ragged breaths echoing in the warehouse. I bolt in the opposite direction, scrambling over boxes, my injured arm throbbing, my chest burning. There has to be another way out of here. Some fire escape I missed, some door, anything. I find a door, a loading dock door. It swings open and I'm face to face with the docks, the thick salty fog rolling in like a living thing. My heart leaps, I think I might be safe. I take off running across the creaking wood slats. Out of the corner of my eye, I see it that monstrous shape lumbering out of the warehouse, gaining on me. The fog's so thick I can barely see where I'm going. I hear a splash and realize I'm about to run off the end of the damn dock. I skid to a stop, but too late my boot goes over the edge. I'm falling, and there's a huge splash as I hit the freezing water. That jolt of cold shocks me back into reality. I start swimming clumsily, gasping, the adrenaline keeping me from going under. My shoulder explodes in pain as I try to haul myself up onto the slimy pilings below the dock. It's a half-conscious scramble, but somehow I make it. I lie there, shivering uncontrollably, listening. I still hear that horrible breathing somewhere out in the fog, but the dock stretches and twists into the gloom and I can't tell which way it's coming from. It could circle back, could be anywhere. There's only one thing I can do. Keeping low, I start crawling deeper into the maze of pilings and rusted beams. It's impossible to see anything, and the smell of rotting wood and sea muck is overpowering. I try to muffle my coughs, but it's no use. 
Those damn raspy breaths are getting louder. My fingers find a loose rung of a ladder heading upwards. I try to climb quietly, but my bad arm is useless. I manage to pull myself up a few steps and then I freeze. Those dragging footsteps are right beneath me. I press myself flat against the slimy ladder, barely daring to breathe. Somehow, it doesn't seem to see me, just shuffles past. I wait until the footsteps have faded to a whisper in the fog. Then, with what strength I have left, I keep climbing. Up and up into the swirling mist until I reach another deserted dock level. There's a small shed up ahead, battered but locked. I pick up a rusty piece of metal from the ground, start hammering at the padlock until it breaks. I stumble into the blessed darkness, collapse on the floor, and finally pass out. When I wake up, the fog is starting to burn off. Sirens are wailing in the distance. I look out the shed window. Police cars swarm over the docks and paramedics are loading someone into an ambulance. I can't make out much from this distance, but even from here it's clear that body they put inside the ambulance is way too small to be whatever the hell attacked me back in the warehouse. The police comb the docks, the warehouses, for hours. They find me eventually, shaking and babbling. I tell them about the creature, or the man, I don't even know what to call it. Of course, they don't believe a word of it. They find blood in the warehouse, the sailor's body. There's talk of drugs, me being hopped up and seeing things, but deep down I know what happened. I know what I saw, and I know it's still out there. The cops take my statement, release me on the condition I get mental help whatever. They never find a trace of any other person, just animal tracks that could have been anything wandering around that derelict old place. In the news reports, they refer to the sailor's death as a freak accident, some unsolved mystery. Me, I pack up what few things I own, quit my job that same day, and split on the next bus out of town. Never look back. I end up changing my name, figure a clean slate's the only way to start over after something like that. Maybe if I call myself something different, it can't follow me. Maybe it'll think I'm already dead. Sometimes, though, late at night, I still hear those dragging footsteps, that ragged breathing in my nightmares. Sometimes I swear, when a fog rolls in and I get that damp, coppery smell, I think I catch a glimpse of something monstrous lumbering past in the shadows. It makes me think, maybe it was never really hunting me. Maybe it was hunting him, whoever the hell he was. It's 1970, and I'm in my early twenties. Me and some buddies figured we'd try our luck in this old fishing town on the Oregon coast, Coos Bay. There wasn't much money in it, but it felt better than being back home stuck on my old man's farm. My name's Jonah, by the way. So, I end up getting this job as a caretaker at this old abandoned hotel right on the beach. Creepy place, built back in the twenties and barely touched since. Some rich investor supposedly has been buying up all the waterfront properties and wants it renovated, but in the meantime, my job was to make sure no squatters moved in. Easy money, or so I thought. This particular night, there's this monster storm rolling in, the kind where it sounds like the whole damn ocean's gonna come crashing through the windows. And of course, the power goes out. Great. I'm sitting there with my flashlight trying to entertain myself with some old magazine when I hear it, a knock at the back door. At first, I think it's just the wind or something. But then it comes again, insistent thumping. Finally, I decide to be brave, or stupid, looking back, and I crack open the door. Nobody's there. 
All I see is the rain lashing down, swirling in the dim light from the street lamps. I'm about to shut the door when I smell it, kind of like rotten seaweed and something metallic, like blood. I swing my flashlight beam around the corner, and that's when I see the footprints. Big ones, barefoot in the mud. They lead away from the hotel, down towards the beach. I tell myself it's probably some drunk passed out on the sand, but something about those prints makes my skin crawl. I end up grabbing a kitchen knife, biggest one I can find, and heading out after the footprints. I gotta admit, I'm more than a little freaked out. I keep thinking, what the hell am I gonna find down there? A wild animal, a crazy person. And then I see it. A silhouette against the churning waves. A figure so big that at first my brain insists it's just a trick of the light. I edge closer, trying to stay out of sight. It's hunched over something in the sand. At first it makes a ragged, choking sound that almost sounds like laughter, but then I realize it's crying. And that's when I finally make out what it's hunched over, a woman's body. Her clothes are torn and soaked in blood that shines black in the rain. I try to scream, but my voice is gone, stuck in my throat. The figure spins at the sound and suddenly I see its face in my flashlight beam. Empty eye sockets. A nose like raw, chewed up flesh. Hair in slimy clumps. And then it grins a wide, gaping grin filled with jagged teeth. Pure terror kicks in. I drop the knife, turn, and run. Blind panic makes me clumsy and I stumble, fall onto the wet sand. I try to scramble back up but there's a searing pain in my ankle and when I look down, I see a hand like a huge claw clamped tight around it, nails digging into my flesh. The thing drags me back towards the woman's body. I fight it, my hands full of wet sand, but it's inhumanly strong. I can smell its rancid breath, see the drool glistening on those jagged teeth getting closer and closer. Just when I think I'm done for, I hear a car engine revving. I turn my head and see headlights cutting through the storm. There's shouting. Someone spotted what's happening and pulled over. That seems to spook the thing. It releases my ankle and lurches back into the darkness with a hissing sound. I lie there in the rain, sobbing and clutching my injured leg as the car screeches to a halt beside me. A couple, bless their hearts, get out and rush to my side. The guy tries to give chase, but it's already gone, vanished back into the storm. The next few hours are a blur. The couple helps me back into their car, calls for an ambulance, the police arrive, and then it's all flashing lights and questions. I repeat my story over and over until even I can't bear to think about it anymore. They end up taking me to the hospital, where my ankle gets patched up along with the cuts and bruises I got while fighting back. Of course, everyone assumes I'm high as a kite. The hotel had a bit of a reputation, and a young guy working there alone? It fits the junkie attacked by his own hallucinations narrative perfectly. Except for the body. They find the dead woman the next morning, washed up on the beach down the way. It makes the news, a gruesome story in the local paper. But my description of the attacker is dismissed with a shake of the head as drug-fueled ravings. They search the hotel, the surrounding area, and find nothing. No trace of anyone, and no other signs of a struggle where I said it happened. The police end up writing it off as a vagrant who murdered the woman and then disappeared. Case closed as far as they're concerned. But I know what I saw. I know I'm not crazy. And I know that what killed her is still out there. Months later... I can't shake it off. The nightmares won't stop, the smell of rotten seaweed and blood lingering no matter where I go. I end up leaving Coos Bay, leaving the coast altogether. Figure if it's still alive, it's got the whole damn ocean to hide in. 
I bounce around, never staying anywhere too long. Sometimes I get a job like I did there, caretaker or night watchman in forgotten buildings. Always in the back of my mind is the fear that I might stumble across a footprint in the mud, see that hulking shadow out of the corner of my eye. But maybe that's almost worse than actually finding it again. At least then I'd know I wasn't just going mad. A couple years after that night, I'm working at this abandoned motel in Nevada. Another stormy night, and I'm on edge. But then I see something in the parking lot under the flickering lights. It looks huge, hunched, moving towards the back of the building. My heart pounds louder than the rain, but this time my feet don't freeze up. I grab a busted pipe I keep stashed under the desk for emergencies and head outside. It could be anything, a drunk, a lost hiker. But I have to know. As I get closer, I realize it's a kid, a teenage boy, soaking wet and shivering. He's barefoot and skinny as a rail. When he turns around, his eyes are wide and wild, like a cornered animal. His mouth opens as though he's going to scream, and for a heart-stopping second, I expect to see those jagged teeth, that empty, rotting face. Then he just whispers, Please, please help me. My heart's pounding like a damn drum and this rusty pipe feels useless in my hands. Then the kid does something unexpected. He drops to his knees and starts sobbing. They killed them. He gasps out between the tears. I couldn't do nothing. This isn't some monster. This is a scared, hurt kid. I lower the pipe and go to him. He flinches away at first, but then lets me touch him, lets me guide him back towards the motel. My mind's racing a mile a minute, but the one thing I know for sure is I need to get him somewhere safe. I find some old blankets and get him settled in the abandoned office. Then I make him tell me everything. His voice is shaky, the words tumbling out between sobs. Turns out his name's Levi. He'd run away from a terrible foster home a few towns over, and he'd been living rough, on the streets, in abandoned places, for weeks. He tells a story about a group of men he'd met a few days ago, older drifters who'd offered him food and shelter. He thought he'd finally lucked out, but they'd taken him to this shack out in the desert, and then he starts to describe what he saw inside. Stuff that matches up with the vague nightmares I've been half-suppressing since Coos Bay. Stuff that makes my blood go cold. They killed them. He whimpers. A man and a woman. It was horrible. He trails off, then looks up at me with those haunted eyes. I think they're the ones who did that to you that night, the one on the beach. A chill runs through me. He's right. It has to be them. He describes these men, rough, dirty, and all with this sort of strange, feral glint in their eyes. I'm about to call the police when Levi grabs my arm, desperate. No, please don't. They'll find me. They'll take me back. He's shaking like a leaf. And that's when I make a decision. I might be crazy, might be making the worst mistake of my life but I tell him he can stay with me. For now, at least. Figure we can move around, lay low, make ourselves disappear. It's better than letting him fall back into the hands of those monsters. A couple times over the following weeks, I think I see them. A battered old truck that seems to follow me, too often to be a coincidence. Figures watching me in the distance, disappearing when I get close. Sometimes I look at Levi and wonder what I've gotten myself into. Wonder if he's playing me, leading me into some trap. Wonder if maybe those things I saw on the beach, maybe the men who took him, maybe they aren't real. Maybe it's all just damage in my head after that night in Coos Bay. But then I find a newspaper article from a couple years back. 
two missing hikers found dead in a remote part of Oregon. It has a description of the men suspected in the case. They match up perfectly with how Levi describes his tormentors. And I know that whatever's out there, tracking us, it ain't just my imagination. It's 1978, and I'm working as a night watchman for this big shipping facility down by the docks in Long Beach, California. Not the greatest job, but the pay's decent and the nights are mostly quiet. My name's Curtis, by the way. This particular night, there's a thick fog rolling in, the kind that muffles sound and makes your hair stand on end. It's giving me the creeps but I'm mostly just bored. So, I pop inside the security booth for a smoke, something I technically shouldn't do, but who's gonna care? I've got the radio on low, some cheesy country song playing. When it breaks up with static, then cuts out. Huh, that's weird. Suddenly, all the lights in the facility flicker, then die. Great, now I'm alone in the dark. I fumble for my flashlight and nearly jump out of my skin when I hear a thud and a clatter outside. I shine the light towards the noise, expecting a busted transformer or a raccoon nosing through the trash, but the beam cuts through the fog and lands on a shape. A man just standing there, tall and bulky, hard to see clearly in the dim light. He's watching me with this stillness that turns my blood cold. I call out, Hey, who's there? But he doesn't answer. He doesn't even move, not at first. A cold sweat breaks out on the back of my neck. I grab the walkie-talkie off the desk and try to radio for backup, but it's dead. Then, in a slow, jerky motion that looks wrong, like a puppet pulled by strings, the man in the fog starts coming towards me. I stumble backwards, my heart pounding a mile a minute. I know I should run, but my legs feel like they're frozen. All I can do is keep the flashlight trained on him, watch as he gets closer. And that's when I see. It's not a man at all. At least, not any kind of normal man. His face is all wrong, the nose is flat, the eyes too close together. His mouth is stretched in a wide grin full of way too many teeth, and they look ragged and sharp. He makes this awful gurgling, choking noise, and lunges at me. I snap out of my terrified trance, turn, and run. Blind panic makes me clumsy. I trip, and by the time I scramble up, he's almost on top of me. I can smell him, this rotten smell like raw meat. I flail my arms, tried to kick him away, but he pins me down, and I can feel his nails digging into my shoulder. He's so inhumanly strong. My flashlight clatters away somewhere in the fog. Desperate, I manage to grab the walkie-talkie off my belt and bring it smashing down on his head. He screeches and staggers back, giving me a chance to run. I go stumbling down the docks, heart thudding and lungs burning. I can hear him following behind me, those awful gasping, gurgling noises getting closer. I take a sharp turn, praying to find somewhere to hide, some kind of escape. I see a light ahead, a small boat moored at the very end of the pier. Hope surges through me as I sprint towards it. I jump onto the boat and try to cast off but the ropes are tangled and my hands are shaking too much to get them loose. Footsteps clatter closer along the pier, and that horrible, breathless, choking laughter. I grab a rusty boat hook lying on the deck, just as he stumbles through the fog and onto the boat. He's furious, those weird eyes burning with rage. I lash out with the boat hook and catch him in the side but he just snarls and advances on me. This boat's tiny, there's nowhere to run. I swing again, harder this time. 
The hook catches him square in the chest, and he staggers backwards, wailing. There's a splash as he tumbles over the railing and into the dark, swirling water of the harbor. I breathe hard, adrenaline making me shake. I stand there, waiting for him to resurface. But the water stays still. My flashlight beam dances on the surface, then I see it, a spreading pool of crimson staining the black water. That must have been a bad hit. He's either hurt or something else. I don't know which thought is worse. Frantically, I start the motor on the little boat and frantically cut loose the tangled ropes, casting off into the fog. I motor out into the harbor, away from the dock, my heart pounding a frantic rhythm. Every creak of the boat makes me jump, makes me expect him to lunge over the side, all slimy and dripping with seawater. But nothing happens. Eventually, exhausted, I cut the engine and the boat bobs gently on the waves. The fog's so thick I can barely see five feet in front of me. Suddenly, through the muted sounds of the water, I hear it again, that awful gasping, wheezing sound coming from somewhere nearby. Panic flares up again. I grab the boat hook and clutch it like a weapon. There, in a gap in the fog, Less than twenty feet away is another boat, a small fishing trawler. And on its deck, a figure is hunched over, his back rising and falling as he coughs and retches. It's him. I watch, horrified, as he shakily staggers to his feet. He's soaked and shivering, but alive. And somehow, that makes it all the more terrifying. I realize why he looks so wrong. So inhuman, he's covered in thick, glistening scales. Fish scales. Not just a few, but head to toe. The dim moonlight glints off them as he turns towards me, and I get a clear glimpse of his face. It's more fish than man now, all bulging eyes and gaping, toothy maw. He looks at me and lets out a low, rasping growl. My stomach turns and I retch over the side of the boat. I realize what happened, why I ended up on that dock. It wasn't a coincidence. He was hurting me, driving me out onto the water. Trapping me. He leaps from the fishing trawler towards my boat, with shocking speed. Desperation kicks in. I gun the motor and swerve away, barely managing to avoid his grasping clawed hands. He lands in the water with a splash and disappears beneath the waves. I don't stop to think. I motor that tiny boat like my life depends on it, which it does. Back towards the shore, back towards the lights that I can barely make out through the fog. I run the boat aground, jump out, and start running without a backward glance not stopping until I reach the streets and flag down a police cruiser. I tell them everything, about the attack, about the weird guy who wasn't really a guy. They look at me like I'm crazy, drunk, on drugs. They don't believe a word of it. They search the docks, the shore, and find nothing. No body, no overturned boat, not a trace of what I saw. They write the whole thing off as the result of a head injury and bad dreams. In the end, I'm left more confused than when I started. Was it hallucination brought on by stress and darkness? Or is there something out there in the harbor, something that changes shape and hunts under the cloak of fog? Something that perhaps waits? It's a question that keeps me awake at night, a question I know I'll never have the answer to. Sometimes, when a fog rolls in, I think I hear those weird, gurgling coughs, and I swear I can feel his eyes watching me from the shadows. It's 1975, and I'm one of those lucky guys working a summer job on the oil rigs off the Texas coast. It's tough work, long hours, but at least the pay's more than decent. 
My name's Danny, by the way. This particular night, there's this monster storm churning in the gulf. Normally I hate sleeping on the rig. Too noisy, the whole thing shaking and groaning with every wave. But tonight I'm actually glad of it since we're not going anywhere. I managed to crash out early. I'm woken up by this weird sound. Kinda like a scratching, but also, wet? At first, I assume it's just the storm, but as I wake up more, I realize it's coming from inside the cabin. I sit up, heart pounding. Across the small room, I see my roommate, Jeff, still sleeping soundly. Maybe it's him, snoring weird? But then the sound comes again, closer. It's coming from under his bunk. I cautiously slide off my own bunk, grab a flashlight, and kneel down to peer into the dark space. Nothing out of the ordinary. Old boots, a duffel bag, wait. There, a flicker of movement in the far corner. With a gasp, I jerk backwards as something darts out from the shadows, landing at my feet. It's a rat, but the biggest damn rat I've ever seen, like the size of a cat. Shiny wet fur, long bald tail, and beady red eyes. It scurries across the floor before disappearing under my bunk. Jeff, wake up! I shake his shoulder. He groans and rolls over. Dude, what's so important? Just cause there's a storm doesn't mean... He trails off as I shine the flashlight around the room. His eyes widen. What the hell was that? He scrambles backwards, pressing himself against the wall. Giant freaking rat. I tell him, and before Jeff can answer, it's back. The rat scurries out, circles the cabin, squeaking and chittering. It's almost as if it's sizing us up. Jeff grabs a pipe wrench off the floor. Come on, rat face, wanna dance? But he's trying too hard to make a joke. We're both scared. The rat darts towards him, and he swats at it with the wrench. It hisses and scurries under my bunk again, out of reach. Jeff and I stare at each other, breathing hard. That thing was straight out a nightmare, Jeff mutters. But that's not even the weirdest part. As I listen to its claws scraping under the bunk, a horrible realization starts to dawn. That rat didn't come up the mooring ropes. It came from inside the rig. We hear a scuffle and a muffled shout from the cabin next door. We look at each other, panic rising. There's more of them. What if it's not just rats? I whisper. Something way bigger could have swum in during the storm, found its way inside, something that sees those rats as snacks. We grab our flashlights and pipes. This time, we're not gonna wait around to find out what it is. We make a run for the cabin door, throw it open, and smack right into a guy, a big, burly dude, one of the engineers. He looks dazed and terrified, blood trickling down his cheek. He points behind us, voice shaking. There's something, something in there. The engineer manages to gasp out a few words. It got, got Mark. Then he doubles over, retching, and when he straightens up, his eyes roll back showing only white. With a groan, he collapses onto the metal decking. We stare in horror. Nobody moves. The air crackles with tension. Then, there's a scream from down the corridor. A woman's scream cut brutally short. We hear running, pounding footsteps. Get the hell out of there! Someone shouts. One of the drill crew, I think. Jeff, the engineer, and I exchange a panicked look. No choice, we've got to move. We sprint down the corridor, boots clanging on the metal floor flashlights beams slicing through the darkness. The smell is getting overpowering, rotten fish and something metallic, like blood. We reach the stairwell, just in time to see a huge, shadowy form disappearing down the stairs, 
moving with unnatural speed and agility. Jeff takes off after it, with a yell that sounds more angry than scared. The rest of us follow. The chase leads deep into the bowels of the rig. Pipes and machinery loom around us, the shadows dancing with the flickering of our flashlights. The stairways get narrower and steeper, slick with seawater and something slimy. I keep expecting the thing, whatever it is, to jump out at us. But it doesn't. Finally, we reach the lowest level the engine room. It's flooded, a couple of feet of water swilling around giant, humming machines. We hear a splash from the far side of the room, and then I see it. There, silhouetted against the dim emergency lights, is a figure. Tall, broad-shouldered, but somehow wrong. He's hunched over something in the water, moving with a jerking, animalistic twitch. Mark? Someone whispers, hope in his voice that makes me want to vomit. The figure turns. And even in the dimness, we can all see it. Where his face should be, there's smooth, hairless skin stretched tight, and eyes, too many eyes, glinting in the gloom. It lets out a low hiss and we can see a long, forked tongue flick out of its jaw. For a heartbeat, we're frozen in place. Then the thing lunges straight at us with a speed that doesn't seem possible. The next few minutes are a blur of shouting, splashing, and the frantic swinging of pipes and flashlights. Somehow, we manage to fight back, to drive it off, just as the rescue crews finally make their way down from the top deck. In the aftermath, the rig is evacuated, the Coast Guard brought in. I try to explain, to make sense of it, but the words sound crazy even in my own head. They search, but find nothing. No sign of the creature, no evidence other than a few bloodstains and some deeply gouged metal. The whole thing gets written off as an accident, some freak wave in the storm knocking someone out and causing a gas leak that led to the rest of us hallucinating. But we all know what we saw. We know something inhuman shared that storm-tossed rig with us, something the lights didn't quite reach into the darkest corners. In the end, they call me up for a psych evaluation. Say I might be suffering from PTSD. Maybe I am. After all, I startle at every creak of the floorboards and bolt awake at night drenched in sweat. But it's not just nightmares that keep me up. It's wondering, what if it isn't over? What if it's still out there in the ocean, waiting, biding its time? And the worst part is, I think I'd recognize that slick, hairless skin and those glittering eyes anywhere. It's 1973 and being on this Alaskan fishing trawler is the closest thing to hell I can imagine. The relentless sleet, the stink of dead fish. I swear it's going to drive me crazy before the season's even half over. My name's Wyatt, by the way. But tonight, tonight it's not the drudgery that's got me on edge. It's the empty bunk across from me. It was Ben's bunk until two nights ago. See, the thing about Ben, he wasn't the friendliest guy. Kept to himself, mostly. But even a surly jerk like him didn't deserve what happened. One minute he's hauling in the nets, the next there's a scream, and he's gone. Nobody saw a damn thing, just the rope trailing off the stern into the icy black water. The company line is he fell overboard. Accident. But I'm not buying it. You don't just fall when you've been a fisherman your whole life. The whispers have already started among the crew. Something pulled him under. Something big. This morning, as we're checking equipment, I spot it. A deep gouge along the side of the boat, like something huge with claws dragged itself along the hull. The captain sees it too, and I notice he goes a shade paler. But he just shrugs it off, says it must have been driftwood. 
I'm not so sure. Night falls again, and this time I don't even try to sleep. I huddle up on deck, shotgun in my hands, eyes glued to the swirling darkness. The sea here is deep, cold, old. Who knows what could lurk beneath the surface? Ben wasn't the first to go missing out here, that's for sure. I hear it before I see it. A low, rumbling sound that seems to come from the depths. The hair on the back of my neck stands up. Then I catch sight of a dark shape breaking the waves. It's big, way bigger than any fish, any whale. As it draws closer, I see thick scales glistening in the moonlight and a long, sinuous neck rising from the water. My heart's pounding so hard I think it might burst. I take aim and fire. The shotgun roars in the silence, but the creature seems unfazed. With a flick of its tail it dives under the surface and disappears. I stand there, shaking, listening. The sea sloshes against the hull. The wind whistles through the rigging. And beneath it all, I swear I can still hear that low, rumbling growl. The rest of the night is a blur of adrenaline and terror. I tell the captain when he comes out on deck, but he just looks at me like I'm losing my mind. He even threatens to replace me if I start spreading crazy stories. I'm alone in this. And when the sun starts to peek over the horizon, I have a sickening realization. Whatever's out there, it's still circling. Watching. Waiting. Panic slams into me, but it's a cold determined kind of panic. I'm not going down without a fight. Grabbing a harpoon, I climb onto the railing, ready to face what lurks below. The other crew members are starting to stir, shouting at me. The captain runs towards me, yelling for me to get down. But I ignore them. I stare into the murky water, knowing it could erupt into chaos at any second. My knuckles are white around the harpoon. I hear something behind me, a gasp. I whirl around and see a look of stark terror on the captain's face. He's pointing behind me. I slowly turn, a chill washing over me. Rising from the waves is the creature, now so close I can see its eyes gleaming like yellow marbles, its long neck weaving back and forth. Its mouth opens revealing rows of needle-sharp teeth. All I can do is stare. My body's tense to spring, but part of me knows it's useless. The thing is way too big, way too fast. I'm frozen in space and time. The others on the crew are screaming now. Some grab weapons, others are just trying to scramble away. The captain, he's yelling something at me but his words get lost in the roar of the creature crashing onto the deck. Chaos erupts. The boat tips violently, tossing men overboard into the icy water. Wood splinters as the creature's massive weight crushes nets and equipment. I barely manage to keep my footing as the thing thrashes, its long neck whipping back and forth, snagging one of the crewmen. With a terrible shriek, He's yanked into the air and disappears down its gaping maw. I gag back a cry of horror. The creature's gaze snaps towards me. I see the intelligence there, the cruel calculation. This isn't just random hunger, it's hunting us. I don't even have time to think before it lunges, its huge jaws opening wide. I leap out of the way, rolling across the slick, tilted deck. The captain fires his rifle wildly. I stumble to my feet and grab the harpoon lying discarded on the deck. I know it's a desperate act, but it's all I've got left. The creature rears up, scales gleaming, and comes at me again. I scream and charge, ramming the harpoon deep into its side. A geyser of warm blood bursts forth, blinding me. The creature shrieks, a piercing bone-chilling sound that cuts through the night. Suddenly, it goes limp and slides off the deck, taking the harpoon with it. 
The boat shudders as the massive body crashes back into the water and vanishes into the depths. For a few moments, there's only the lapping of waves against the hull and the terrified gasps of those of us who survived. Then we hear the shouts of the rescue boats approaching, cutting through the darkness. I collapse on the deck, every muscle in my body trembling. I'm alive, but at what cost? The official report, of course, is that we hit some uncharted rocks in the storm. Damage the boat, a few guys injured, one tragically lost overboard, Ben. They never find his body. They chalk the gouges on the hull up to wreckage, and my story about a sea monster, well, that gets me a one-way ticket to a mandatory psych eval. They send me home, telling me I just need some rest and I'll be back out on the boats in no time. But they couldn't be more wrong. Every time I close my eyes, I see that huge, scaly body rising from the waves. Hear the screams of my crewmates cut off mid-sentence. Feel the icy spray of blood on my face. And there's the lingering, horrible thought that began to take shape amidst the terror. A suspicion I can't quite shake. I don't think the creature was just passing through. We didn't damage its territory by accident. I saw the cunning in its eyes. It wanted us here. This was its hunting ground. The ocean suddenly seems a lot bigger, a lot darker, than it ever did before. Maybe Ben wasn't the first, and neither were we the last. Maybe out there, in those vast depths, something ancient, something hungry, is still waiting. It was my freshman year of college, back in 1967. I moved into the dorms and got settled, excited for the new experience. This rundown old building was a relic of a different era, a massive concrete block with no trace of charm. My assigned room was on the top floor, tucked away at the end of a narrow, maze-like hall. Nathan, my new roommate, seemed cool enough. Messy, sure, but friendly and always with a joint at hand. We became fast friends, and before long, we settled into a routine. Then, one night, I woke up to the sound of scratching on the window. It was faint at first, a hesitant clawing against the glass. I lay there half asleep, disoriented, and convinced it was just a bad dream. But it persisted, a steady, rhythmic scrape that sent chills down my spine. I jolted awake. The room was pitch black, Nathan's bed empty. But that scratching, louder now. I fumbled for the lamp, knocking it over in the process. The loud thump echoed in the quiet night. Finally, my hand found the switch, and the room flooded with harsh fluorescent light. I squinted and looked at the window. Nothing. It was a moonless night, the darkness outside thick and oppressive. I took a deep breath, trying to settle my racing heart. It had to have been a bird or a branch caught in the wind. Still, I couldn't shake the feeling of unease. The next few nights passed without incident. I dismissed the sound as a figment of my imagination a result of freshman jitters or maybe too much of the weed Nathan so generously shared. Then, it started again. This time, it was different. The scratching was louder, more insistent. It was accompanied by whispers, soft and indistinguishable at first, but growing clearer with every second. I couldn't understand the words, but the tone was malevolent, filled with a quiet fury that sent ice through my veins. I lay frozen with fear, staring at the window, desperately wanting to run but unable to move. Suddenly, a face pressed against the glass. It was distorted, elongated, and its features were blurred in the dim light, but I saw enough to make my blood run cold. The eyes were wide, unblinking, and filled with a chilling intensity. 
a scream lodged in my throat as the figure disappeared. I scrambled out of bed, heart pounding, and fumbled for the doorknob. My fingers felt clumsy, useless in the face of overwhelming terror. I finally burst into the hallway, gasping for breath. Nathan! Where are you? My voice trembled, echoing in the silent corridor. There was no answer, no sign of my roommate. I ran down the hall, banging on doors, crying for help. Some sleepy, confused faces poked out, but no one had seen anything, heard a thing. I must have looked like a man-man, wild-eyed and breathless, babbling about a face in the window and whispering threats. The guys in the room next door finally calmed me down enough to get out a mostly coherent version of what had happened. They checked the window, the narrow alleyway below, but there was no trace of anyone. Just the oppressive darkness and the lingering echo of my own screams. The police came, of course. They took a report, looked around, and left with shrugs and reassurances that it was probably just a prank. Prank? This felt like something far darker. That night I didn't sleep. I sat at the window, a flickering candle casting long shadows on the walls. My eyes strained against the darkness, my mind filled with visions of that monstrous face and those chilling whispers. As dawn approached, exhausted and defeated, I decided to take a shower and try to clear my head. The bathroom was at the opposite end of our floor, shared by the entire wing. I walked through the empty hallway, the flickering fluorescent lights adding to the eerie atmosphere. When I finally reached the bathroom, the door was slightly open. My heart gave a sickening lurch. I wasn't alone. I heard a soft, wet sound, like something being dragged across the tile floor. Nathan? I called out my voice barely above a whisper. My hand nudged the door slowly, fear making each motion feel impossibly heavy. There, on the floor of the bathroom, was a horrific sight. Nathan lay sprawled in a pool of blood, his eyes staring vacantly at the ceiling. His skin was pale, almost translucent, and, and he was missing a leg. The limb had been severed just below the knee and the bloody stump was crudely wrapped in towels. Sobbing, I stumbled back, my knees giving out, a guttural scream tearing from my throat. Someone was in the shower stall, the curtain drawn. I didn't want to know. I couldn't bear to see what else. Who else? I ran. Blindly. Tripping and crashing into the walls, I ran down the dark hall. Behind me, I heard the sounds of the shower curtain being ripped open. Then, heavy footsteps pounding the floor, getting closer. My feet barely touched the ground as I hurtled towards the stairs. Images of Nathan's lifeless body flashed through my mind, propelling me forward in a haze of pure adrenaline. I didn't know where I was going, just that I needed to get away. The pounding footsteps grew louder, the sound echoing through the stairwell. I risked a glance over my shoulder. He was gaining, a horrifying figure cloaked in shadow. Tall and gaunt, he shuffled with an unnatural gait, his ragged clothes hanging loosely on his skeletal frame. I stumbled, nearly pitching down the stairs, but somehow caught myself and continued my desperate flight. The exit door swung into view, my only hope. I reached for the handle, fingers trembling, and then, it hit me. The realization struck with the force of a physical blow. Nathan wouldn't leave the dorm without those damn keys. They were always clipped to his belt loop, right next to the flask. His murderer could have them now. I fumbled through my pockets, but of course, I didn't have mine. We'd always counted on Nathan's forgetfulness when we got locked out late at night. Panic surged through me. Trapped. There was nowhere to go. Behind me, 
the footsteps grew closer. I whirled around, searching for a weapon, anything, just as the first light of dawn crept across the horizon, casting long, sharp shadows down the stairwell. That's when I saw him in full. His face was sunken, pale, marked with crisscrossing scars and a set of mismatched eyes, one icy blue, the other a cloudy brown. His teeth were jagged and yellow, snarled in a feral grin. And then he lunged. We fell in a tangle of limbs, his long, bony fingers clawing at my face. I fought back with the ferocity of a cornered animal, kicking and scratching, desperate for any chance. A wave of nausea washed over me as I caught a whiff of him, a mixture of rotten meat, stale sweat, and something else, an underlying chemical tang I couldn't place. I bit into his outstretched hand as hard as I could, feeling flesh tear between my teeth. He yelped, momentarily distracted, but didn't let go. Then, a blinding pain shot through my shoulder as he sunk his teeth into me. I screamed, thrashing blindly. My fingers found something hard beneath his ragged shirt, a makeshift handle, the sharp metal edge protruding from the fabric. In a surge of desperation, I grabbed it and twisted, feeling the cold steel rip into flesh. He held in pain, releasing his grip, stumbling back a few steps. My vision swam, and for a moment I was certain I would faint. But with a last jolt of adrenaline, I scrambled to my feet. Clutching the makeshift weapon close to my chest, I backed cautiously up the stairs, my eyes never leaving him. Step by agonizing step, I retreated, willing my legs to keep moving. I didn't dare look away, not when that twisted nightmare stood on the landing below, staring at me with those mismatched, predatory eyes. When I finally made it back to my floor, I fumbled for the doorknob, my hands shaking uncontrollably. Inside, I slammed the door shut and shoved a chair under the handle for good measure. Slumping to the floor, every muscle in my body felt like it was on fire. I couldn't fathom what had just happened. What was that man? Who was he? Why was he after me? The police came, of course. It was a blur. The questioning, the search, the endless stream of unfamiliar faces invading our cramped dorm room. They recovered Nathan's body, hauled away the blood-soaked towels he was wrapped in. Eventually, they left, promising a full investigation. I was alone again with nothing but the lingering stench of that creature, clinging to the walls, to my skin. The rest is even blurrier. Weeks, maybe months, a haze of prescription painkillers and sleepless nights filled with echoing footsteps and haunting whispers. The university offered me another room, a different dorm, but I couldn't go back. That place, it was tainted. The scratches on the window visible only in a certain light, were a constant reminder of the horror lurking outside the edges of safety. Finally, I packed my things and left that cursed campus, never to return. It's been years now. There were whispers, of course. Some said it was a crazy drifter, others blamed drugs, or a twisted fraternity initiation gone wrong. I never knew the full truth, the real reason for the bloodshed. The scars, both physical and emotional, faded gradually, but they never fully vanished. Sometimes, late at night when the wind howls outside my window, I think I hear those footsteps, that chilling whisper carrying through the darkness. Maybe it was all a nightmarish hallucination, a figment of a traumatized mind. Or maybe... There really is something monstrous out there, just waiting for the right moment to strike again. I started college back in 1967, in a town I'd never set foot in before, Grand Rapids, Michigan. 
I wasn't rich, not by a long shot. So my old man helped get me a room above some bar, way out on the edge of town. Place was called the Rusty Nail, cheesy wood paneling and everything. Room cost practically nothing, which suited me fine, cause that meant I could put my lousy grocery store wages towards tuition. The upstairs was weird. Not rundown, exactly, more like it had seen better days. Old wallpaper, stained carpets, the whole nine yards. And it was a maze, winding hallways and more doors than you'd believe. Half of them were boarded shut. The other half were rented out. There was me, some hippie dude I never talked to, and this older guy, Everett. Everett always creeped me out, truth be told. Not a bad dude, he'd give me a nod in the hallway, that kind of thing. But man, he was old. Like ancient. Skinny as a rail too, with this long gray hair and eyes sunk back in his head. Wore outdated clothes, looked like something out of the 1940s. Just the sight of him gave me the shivers. One night, it was probably October, a damp chill in the air. I'm coming home from my shift, dead tired, and I hear it. Just the faintest sound, coming from under Everett's door. It's low, kinda scratchy and rhythmic. Makes my skin crawl. Now, here's the thing. I'm not a scaredy cat. College kid, felt pretty invincible back then. So, me being me, I lean right up against his door and listen harder. It's hard to explain the sound. Like someone dragging something heavy, then a sharp click, drag and a click, over and over. My mind starts racing. Is, is that someone hurt in there? Trapped? But then another voice cuts through the noise. It's Everett, thin and high-pitched. He's mumbling something, counting maybe? One, two, three, then that dragging sound again. It gets louder, like it's coming closer to the door. I don't know what got into me. Maybe it was being tired, or maybe it was seeing the door handle jiggle. I throw it open. The room's dark, the heavy curtains drawn, and it stinks. Like old meat or something, thick and sickly. There's Everett, bent over, hunched, back turned to me. He's pulling something across the floor, a big burlap sack, and it's leaving a wet trail behind it. Everett? My voice cracks like I haven't spoken in a week. He spins around so fast it doesn't seem natural. In his hands is... I don't even know how to explain it. Not a tool I'd ever seen. Sharp, with this weird curve to it, all rusted and brown. And there's red on it. Close the door, boy. That voice. It doesn't even sound like him. Not high-pitched anymore, but low and raspy, like gravel. The light catches him from the hallway. That's when I see it, those hollowed-out eyes staring back at me. They're wide as can be, and there's this hunger to them, like he's not seen fresh meat in a decade. I slam the door shut. Don't even think, just bolt for the stairs. My legs are moving on their own, heart pounding so hard I figure it'll burst out of my chest. Once I hit the bottom floor, I'm out the door, running down the street so fast my lungs start to burn. I didn't even look back. I don't sleep much that night, just lie awake, staring at the ceiling. In the back of my head, I know what I saw. Makes sense, too. Isolated place. No one would miss a college kid gone AWOL. But the cops? They'd laugh at me, say I'd been hitting the books too hard. The next day... I do what anyone would do. I get the hell out of there. Find a dumpy apartment on the other side of town. Don't even bother going back for my stuff. Now I never saw Everett again after that night. I don't even know if he's still alive, honestly. He would have been ancient by now. 
But sometimes, when I can't sleep, I hear that dragging sound again, that click, that horrible voice counting. And I wonder, how many more were dragged across that floor? I never found out what was in that burlap sack, and truth be told, I don't want to know. But here's the thing, sometimes I see reports on the news, some unidentified body washed up miles away, or bones found out in the woods. And a part of me thinks, is that whoever it might have been counting? Did he keep going year after year, hunting for victims? It's enough to make me grateful for the lousy pay at the supermarket, kept me out late so I was there that night. Otherwise, maybe it would have been me under that burlap, with Everett counting one, two, three. I was living in a little cabin outside Moab, Utah, back in 1968. I'd always been a city kid, but something called me out to the desert after I left the army. Needed the quiet, I reckon. Found a part-time gig at the hardware store in town. Spent the rest of my time hiking those red rock canyons and getting lost on purpose. My name's Wyatt, by the way. This particular night, I'd been scrambling through those slot canyons all day and was feeling pretty wired. It was a clear night, so I didn't even bother with the propane lamp when I got back. I just made a sandwich, cracked open a beer, and sat out on my little porch. Now, my cabin was remote. Like, middle of nowhere remote. The only sign of civilization was a dirt road a few miles away that tourists used to get to the park. Even so, it was unnerving to see the headlights. They started off small and distant, then slowly made their way toward me cars on that road at this hour? Strange thing. I thought maybe it was just some young kids getting adventurous, but as the headlights got closer, I realized these weren't headlights. Too high up wrong shape. For just a second, I hoped it might be a ranger on patrol. But the feeling in my gut wasn't hope. It was flat out dread. Whoever it was, they were coming right for my place. The vehicle stopped out in the sand, just short of my porch, and cut the lights. Dead quiet, except for the chirping of crickets and the sound of the engine ticking as it cooled. I strained my eyes at the dark shape and realized it was a truck, big one. I got up slowly, keeping my movements casual, and walked over. I wasn't an idiot to just approach from the driver's side. I circled around to the back. No license plate. Hello? I called out. No answer. My hand drifted down to the holster at my hip, the .38 revolver I kept out here for coyotes and such. I didn't want to draw it, not yet. Anybody home? I said louder. Still nothing. I walked back and cautiously approached the driver's side. Nobody inside. And that's when I saw it, a smear of blood on the door handle, and something white and crumpled on the floorboards. I drew my gun then, heart pounding. The thing on the floor was a shirt, torn and stained. I leaned in slightly to get a better look. That's when the truck bed rattled as if something big had just shifted. My blood ran cold. I stepped back fast, keeping the gun leveled. The truck door creaked open slowly. Darkness inside. Then I saw him. A man crouched like an animal in the corner of the truck bed. Tall, broad-shouldered, but hunched over like he didn't quite fit in there. He had long, scraggly hair and a beard that covered his face. I couldn't see his eyes in the shadows but I knew he was staring at me. He seemed, feral, like a wildcat that had been cornered. Easy now, I said quietly. Just stay still. Don't want no trouble. My mind was racing. Was this some escaped convict? 
A survivalist gone rabid? Had he hurt someone out there in the canyons? Was he even alone? Then the guy moved. It happened so fast I barely registered it. He launched himself out of the truck bed, landing on all fours like a spider. Then he was up and running, straight at me. I fired off a shot, more of a warning. Maybe the sound would scare him off. It didn't. He didn't even flinch. I fired again. He stumbled a bit. Maybe the bullet grazed him, but he kept on coming. My God, he was fast, and his eyes, they were gleaming in the moonlight now, full of rage. I aimed and fired a third time, right at his chest. He jerked from the impact, and I could have sworn I heard a choked gurgle. But he didn't drop, just slowed down a fraction. I was nearly face to face with him now. In the pale moonlight, I could make out the details of his face. It was gaunt, hollowed out, like he hadn't eaten in weeks. His teeth seemed longer, pointed. And those eyes, they weren't human. I fired two more shots at point-blank range. He staggered but still kept coming. I ran, dropping the revolver in my panic. I had one chance, the cabin. If I could make it inside, bolt the door. I heard his footsteps, gaining on me. Could almost feel his hot breath on my neck. I just about threw out my shoulder slamming that cabin door shut. Fumbled desperately for the deadbolt, found it, threw it. My hands were shaking so badly, it took me three tries to get the key in the padlock. I heard a heavy thud against the door followed by a scraping sound. Dear God, he was trying to claw his way in. I backed away, eyes darting around the tiny cabin. There was only one tiny window, too high up to reach. There was an old shotgun that came with the cabin mounted on the wall, but it was empty, and who knows where I'd stashed the shells. There was an axe by the wood stove, but, no, I couldn't face him up close again. Then I sawed my backpack. I ripped it open, rummaging through until I found my flashlight. It was the big, hefty kind, the kind they issue to cops. I flipped it on. Now I had a weapon, at least. Slowly, I approached the door, raising the flashlight like a club. I took a deep breath and flung the door open. He wasn't there, just the empty night. I shone the flashlight around the porch, then out into the yard. Nothing. I crept outside, scanning the darkness, my light cutting through the dust. I could hear the sound of his ragged breathing somewhere out there. Who are you? I called out, trying to sound brave. My voice cracked embarrassingly in the still air. What the hell do you want? That feral growl was the only answer. There was a flash of movement just beyond the circle where my flashlight illuminated. He was out there, stalking me like prey. That's when the first rock came whizzing past my head. Then another, and another. They were landing in the dirt with a dull thud. I scrambled back, slamming the door again. I was trapped. And he knew it. He started a rhythmic pounding against the door each blow jarring my bones. I tried to back away, but the cabin was too small. It was like being a mouse, backed into the corner of a box, while the cat played his cruel game. There was no way that door was going to hold long. I looked wildly about the room, panic rising in my throat. Then I saw them, the kerosene lamps under the kitchen counter. I had an idea— a desperate one, but maybe the only thing left. I grabbed a lamp, struck a match. Holding it carefully, I edged back toward the door, unlatching it slightly. I shoved the kerosene lamp outside with my foot, then slammed the door shut and relocked it. Through the gap, I saw the lamp hit the ground and shatter, 
the kerosene splashing across the ground. Then, with trembling hands, I tossed the lit match. It arced across the darkness, landing in the pool of fuel. The night erupted in orange flames. I heard his agonized screams over the roar of the fire. There was a sound of thrashing, then silence. It took me an hour to work up the courage to peek back out. The fire had burned itself out, leaving a charred circle and a wisp of smoke. There was no sign of him. The only sound was the relentless chirp of the crickets, a stark contrast to the horror of just moments before. I spent the rest of the night cowering in the corner, staring at the door, shotgun in hand. But he never came back. When the sun finally rose, I ventured out. There were no tracks, no body, nothing to prove what I knew had happened. I wasn't sure if he'd survived the fire or not. But I knew this. He was still out there, somewhere in those rugged canyons. Watching. Waiting. I left the cabin that same day, never looked back. Took a bus as far away as I could get and started a new life, thousands of miles away. But even now, decades later, there are still nights when I hear the scraping at my door, that feral growl in the darkness. And I wonder, will he ever find me? Okay, so it was 1982, and I was just out of college. My name's Jared, by the way. Had this real crummy apartment in this real crummy part of San Jose, the kind of place where you check under your bed before sleeping. Anyway, I'd just been laid off from this tech firm. Startups weren't exactly stable back then either. Money was tight, and my roommate was always bringing back these weirdos for parties that kept me up all night. One Thursday, I'd finally had enough told him he needed to find a new place to crash or get his buddies under control. Big fight, slam doors, the whole deal. Point is, come the weekend, I finally had the apartment to myself for the first time in ages. Now, being the broke twenty-something I was, entertainment plans consisted of a six-pack, some leftover takeout, and whatever junk was on TV. Around midnight, though, the power goes out. Whole neighborhood must have been on the same shoddy grid or something because even the street lights are blinking off one by one. At first, all I feel is irritation. No AC, food's gonna go bad in the fridge. Then that creeping unease sets in. See, my apartment was ground floor, windows facing the parking lot. In the darkness, all I can hear is this, shuffling like someone's walking back and forth right outside. I tell myself it's nothing, probably some drunk, but my gut says to lay low. I peek through the blinds, heart in my throat. It's too dark to see properly, but I swear there's a figure out there. Tall, kinda hunched over. Whatever it is, it's just pacing beside my window. Every creak of the floorboards, every rustle makes me jump. Finally, just as I start to think maybe it's gone, I see a hand reach up, pale in the dim moonlight filtering through the gaps in the blinds. Long, bony fingers drag across the glass. That's when I lose it. I grab the phone, fingers scrambling to dial 911, eyes fixed on that damned window. But of course, the line is dead. Power must have knocked it out. I start to panic. No way am I staying put, some creep out there. I creep towards the tiny kitchen at the back, figure maybe I can try and slip out the window. I'm searching for my keys when I hear it, a scraping sound coming from the front door, like someone's trying the lock. Then, a thud, something heavy slamming into the wood. My blood runs cold. There's nowhere to run. I snatch the biggest kitchen knife I can find, and I back away from the door. If he tries to break in, 
Well, I'll give him hell, that's all I can do. Each creak of the cheap door is torture, waiting for it to give. It keeps up for what feels like forever, the slams, the scraping. Then silence. My hands are shaking, but I figure I've got some time, whatever that sicko's game is. I edge towards the back window and try to push it open. It's rusted shut. I yank at it, again and again, the rusty metal screeching, making a terrifying racket. That's when I notice it's gone quiet again. No footsteps, nothing. I freeze, one hand still gripping that jammed window frame. Did he hear me? What's he waiting for? Then, right outside my bedroom window, it starts. That shuffling sound closer than ever. And this wheezing, labored breathing like someone running a marathon, only wet and raspy. That's when I catch a flicker of something pale moving past the blinds. I drop the knife and stagger back. The shuffling stops right outside. There's a pause, one heartbeat, then two, and then a scratch on the window. A long, bony fingernail dragging down the glass. The terror comes and goes in waves. One second I'm frozen, the next I'm scrabbling around in the dark for anything I can use as a weapon. He keeps circling the apartment. I can hear the shuffling, that damn wheezing breath just on the other side of the walls. Suddenly... I have an idea, stupid in hindsight, but desperation makes you do dumb things. I creep, and I mean creep, towards the front door. Every muscle is screaming at me to just hide, but I remember something. A while back, my crappy landlord promised to install those deadbolt chain locks and never did. He's probably too cheap to get them for all the units. Holding my breath, I ease the front door open a crack. Sure enough, no chain. I take one last look out into the pitch black hallway. Nothing. In one swift motion, I pull the door wide open, dash outside, and slam it shut. Now my only thought is run. I tear down the street, bare feet pounding the asphalt. No idea where to go, but anywhere is better than that apartment. After a few blocks, I duck into the shadows of this overgrown parking lot behind some old warehouse. I think I've lost him. At least the breathing and shuffling's gone. I try and catch my breath, try and make a plan. Cops gotta be the next move, right? As I turn to find a main road, I see it. A lone payphone on the corner. Hope surges and then fizzles as fast as it came. Of course the damn thing's broken. Receiver hanging off, wires ripped out. That's when I see something glint near the base of the payphone. A quarter. Must have fallen when someone yanked at the cord. It's enough. It has to be. I snatch up the coin, fumble with it, and jam it into the slot. Please, please... The dial tone hums back. With shaking hands, I punch a 911 and wait. And wait. Busy signal. I slam the receiver down, heart sinking. What the hell is going on tonight? Another blackout, and now the phone lines are jammed? The absurdity of it distracts me, then dread creeps back in. I make myself move, back towards the main road. Gotta find another phone, somewhere with lights, people. That's when I see the headlights. They appear out of the darkness, twin beams slowly cutting through the night, moving straight towards me. I freeze in the middle of the road, my heart pounding a frantic rhythm. Relief washes over me for the briefest of seconds. Then, the car speeds up. Roars right at me. I dive towards the sidewalk. Tumbling onto the rough concrete, the car swerving past me so close I can feel the rush of air. It breaks hard, and I whirl around to see it reversing, the high beams fixing on me like a spotlight. I'm scrambling to my feet, my mind racing. It's him. 
That maniac found me. Now I know I'm dead. I'm trapped, the car cutting off my escape, and something moves into view within its headlights. A figure steps out of the car on the driver's side. Tall, lanky, his face in shadow. He walks towards me, unhurried, and that's when I see it. A flash of metal in his hand. A knife. It's long and wicked. He stops a few feet from me. Close enough to see his face, or what I can make out in the semi-darkness. Pale skin stretched tight over his skull, gaunt cheeks shadowed under sunken eyes. His lips pull back in a twisted, broken-toothed grin. And that's when he speaks. His voice is raspy, rough, and chillingly calm. Thought you could get away, did you? The police never found him, of course. My description was useless. A tall, skinny guy in the dark, that fit half the damned city. They looked at that junky roommate of mine for a while, but he had a solid alibi. I tried to explain, tried to tell them about the breathing, the scratching. They patted me on the shoulder and told me it was the stress that I needed rest. They think I snapped after the power cut. That I imagined it all. Maybe they're right. Maybe I am going crazy. The thing is, sometimes, in the quiet of my new apartment, top floor with heavy-duty locks, I hear a scratching on the fire escape outside my window. And even if I try to convince myself it's just rats or branches, I can still hear that awful, wheezy breathing. It was 1979. I was in Phoenix for some training course for the insurance company I worked for. Name's Terry, by the way. Boring job, boring city, so when a couple of guys from accounting invited me out after work, I figured. What the hell, right? See, the thing with Phoenix is, the city's kinda in the middle of nowhere. All flat desert and dust for miles around. Well, these guys, they'd found this bar way out on some back road. Real hole-in-the-wall type place, the kind with neon signs flickering in the windows and no telling what goes on inside. We've downed a few beers and are starting to get pretty loose when this girl walks in. Gorgeous, the kind of girl that makes heads turn in a fancy L.A. club, let alone a dive like this. She heads for the bar and the guys I'm with start making those dumb jokes you expect. They offer to buy her a drink, but she just shakes her head, orders something without even looking at the menu. They go back to their beers, kinda deflated, but I can't help but watch her. There's something off. Her clothes are nice, but they're not right for the place. And I catch a glimpse under the table— her heels are covered in dried mud, streaked up her legs a bit. Then it hits me, the rain. It had stormed earlier, a real downpour, rare for this part of Arizona. The roads out here probably turn to muck in that kind of weather. So how'd she get here? No car parked outside that we noticed. I'm about to ask if she needs a ride or something, when the door to the bar swings open again. This guy walks in. I figure he must be with her at first, cause he's tall, built, one of those handsome, rough-looking types, like maybe he works on a ranch or something. But the girl tenses the second she sees him. And he's not looking at her all lovey-dovey, see? He's staring her down with his eyes narrowed, like he's mad at her. He stomps over to the bar and slams his hand on the counter a few inches from her drink. She jumps, but doesn't turn to face him. I hear him say something, low and rough, but I can't make out the words. Finally, she turns slightly and murmurs something back. He snatches her drink, throws it back in one gulp, then grabs her arm and roughly starts to pull her toward the door. I'm on my feet. Maybe I've had a few too many. Maybe it's that hero complex kicking in. 
but I can't just sit by. I yell out, Hey, what do you think you're doing? Leave her alone. He turns. His eyes, man, I swear I've never seen a look like that. Pure meanness, a flash of something cold and vicious, just for a second. This ain't your business, he says, his voice rough and low. One of the guys with me stands up too, puts his hand on my shoulder. Come on, Terry, he says. It's not worth it. He's right. I know he's right. Something about the guy screams danger. But the girl. I push my chair back. Look, man, she obviously doesn't want to go with you. He takes a step towards me. The men in the bar have gone quiet, all eyes on us. He's close enough now for me to see the detail of his face. A jagged scar across his cheek, pale against his tanned skin. Final warning he says, barely moving his lips. Walk away and mind your own damn business. The girl's being hauled backwards towards the door, still not resisting, but looking from me to him, her eyes wide and terrified. For a heartbeat I freeze. Then the guy from accounting tugs at me again. Terry, for real, we gotta go. He hisses. This time I shrug him off. Step closer to the confrontation, determined to stall them. But even as I do, I know it's stupid. This guy, he could snap me like a twig if he wanted to. He must see that moment of hesitation on my face. There's a flicker of something like satisfaction in his eyes. Then he's suddenly slamming the girl out the door with such force that it bangs back against the frame. I hear the lock click as he yanks it shut behind him. For a second, I just stand there, fists clenched, heart pounding. Then I turn back to the bar. The other guys are avoiding my gaze, muttering about how they tried to warn me, about not getting involved. The bartender shrugs. Better to just let sleeping dogs lie, he says, wiping down a glass. I want to scream. Want to smash something, but what for? What could I have done anyway? And now, the girl, she's out there with him, whatever fate awaits her. We finish our beers in silence, the place thick with a kind of unspoken shame. We pay up and head out, but as I'm about to get into the car, I stop. The desert air's cool after the stuffy bar. I turn and look out into the darkness where that bar's lone neon sign casts a dim, reddish glow on the dusty ground. And I think, just maybe I could follow them. See where they go, at least get a license plate to give to the cops. A part of me knows it's a terrible idea. The rest of me is running on gut instinct and a stubborn streak a mile wide. I gotta do something. I tell the guys I need some air and head out, slipping away around the back of the bar so they don't see me get into my car. The neon sign fades in my rearview mirror until all I'm left with is headlights carving a tunnel through the pitch black. Then, up ahead I see it, taillights, twin red spots in the darkness. I hang back, keeping a good distance, my heart pounding a frantic rhythm to the squeaking of my car's old suspension. They turn down this dirt road, a cloud of dust billowing behind them. I slow down, trying not to make a sound. The road's rough, all rocks and bumps, but I gotta keep them in sight. I creep along, every mile seeming to take forever. Finally, the car in front stops. I see it pull off to the side of the road, just a shadowy silhouette against the dark expanse. I kill my lights and keep rolling slowly until I can find a spot to pull over and tuck my car behind some scrub brush. I sit for a long moment, just breathing, trying to calm my nerves. Okay, Terry, what now? I have no idea where we are. Getting caught out here alone is probably even more dangerous than walking back into that bar. But I can't just leave, not knowing for sure. 
I peer into the dark, squinting. The other car is parked just up a small rise. There's enough moonlight to make out figures moving around. The girl's being dragged out the passenger side, the guy shoving her around rough. He says something I can't make out, then turns and walks back towards the car. This could be my chance. He's not paying attention to her. I slip out of my car, trying to avoid making any noise as I make my way up the rise. Crouching low, I risk getting closer. Heart pounding, I manage to get within maybe twenty feet, close enough to hear them clearly this time. What were you tonight? The guy growls. The girl doesn't answer. I can see her hunched over, arms wrapped around herself. I asked you a question. This time, his voice comes with a hard slap. A gasp escapes the girl's lips. He grabs her hair, forcing her head up. Thought you could get away, didn't you? He spits the words. My blood runs cold. So this isn't some random bar fight. It's something far worse. He knows her. The girl's trying to speak, but the words are choked and jumbled. He yanks her closer. You think I'm stupid? He hisses. You can't run forever, you know. Then movement. The guy spins around, back towards the car. He must have heard something. Panic floods through me. He can't see me, can he? I freeze, every muscle tense. He starts walking, searching the darkness. I flatten myself against the ground, praying the shadows are enough to hide me. He's walking right towards my hiding spot, eyes scanning the brush. My breath catches in my throat. Now I'm thinking about the news reports, the ones about girls found dumped in the desert. This is how those stories start. Suddenly, he stops. He looks right at me, it feels like, but there's no way he can see me so well. Still, every nerve in my body screams at me to run. Then, a loud crash comes from where the girls crumpled on the ground. The guy whips around, swearing under his breath. I seize the moment, scramble to my feet, and dash back down the slope. I run blindly, branches tearing at my clothes, tripping over rocks. Finally, I reach my car, throw myself in, and fumble with the keys with shaking hands. I have to get out of here, now. The engine roars to life. I whip the car around, headlights cutting through the dust. I don't stop until I hit pavement, then I gun it, speeding through what must be miles of deserted backroads. When I finally make it to the highway, I practically collapse over the wheel with relief. The next morning, I drive back out to that same bar. Not gonna lie, I almost don't. But it gnaws at me until I can't take it anymore. I tell the bartender everything, even though my voice cracks and my hands shake with the retelling. He listens, then shakes his head, eyes sad. Ain't nothing we can do, son, he says. No proof, no description you could give the police that'd matter out here. Best to let it go. He's right, I know. And still, sometimes, late at night, I see her face. I think about that road, that vast, empty desert where anything could get lost and stay that way forever. And I wonder if she's still out there. It was back in 1982, and I was just out of college, working this temp job in New Mexico. Name's Jason. My roommate, this dude Mike, was a real space cadet always dragging me to these out-of-the-way dive bars in the desert. Place we went to this particular night was a real hole in the wall, the kind even the tumbleweeds wouldn't hang around. We're a few beers in when Mike spots these two girls at the end of the bar. You know the type, big hair, skin-tight jeans, that smoky-eyed look. 
Now, Mike figures he's smooth as all hell, so he saunters over and starts chatting them up. Thing is, I pick up this vibe from one of the girls. Not the one with the bleach blonde hair, but her friend. Brunette, real quiet. She's giving off this tense energy, like a cornered animal. And I notice Mike leaning in real close, practically trapping her against the bar. My gut tells me something's off, so I head over to intervene. Mike doesn't like getting interrupted while he's on the prowl, gives me this glare, but I square my shoulders and meet his gaze. We always had this rivalry going, some alpha male thing I guess. I give the girls a casual smile. Hey, everything all right over here? The blonde scoffs. Mind your own business, dork. The other girl looks at me, her eyes wide with something I can't quite place. Not fear, exactly, but something close. Maybe desperation? Actually, I say, the lady seems a bit uncomfortable. Now Mike scowling, steps up like he wants to make this a physical thing. But behind him, I see the other girl nodding, real subtle. I ignore Mike, address the girls directly. You wanna grab a table, maybe get away from this clown? The blonde hisses something at her friend, but the brunette nods towards the door. I give them some cover, turning back to block Mike. Now he's real riled up and trying to shoulder past me. I'm tempted, real tempted, to let him try, teach him a lesson. But just then, there's a loud crash outside. Everyone in the bar freezes and turns to look. It's like something out of a movie, headlights glaring into the dusty parking lot, and this hulking pickup truck half-swerved into a ditch. A figure stumbles out, a big guy in beat-up jeans and a stained t-shirt. He looks unsteady, swaying back and forth. The whole vibe in the bar shifts from tense to full-blown alarm. This ain't some drunk local. Folks know that. Mike and I exchange a look, and even he backs off. The guy from the truck weaves his way over to the door and pushes it open with a bang. He's built like a linebacker gone to seed, with a wild, overgrown beard and eyes hollowed out with something dark. He scans the room, and for a heartbeat, I think he's heading right for us. Then, his gaze lands on the two girls. Specifically, the brunette. He takes a step forward, and something glints in his hand. My mind races. Is it a knife? A gun? Before anyone can react, the blonde shoves her friend hard, throws a drink in the guy's face, and screeches. Run, Kayla! The brunette, Kayla, doesn't hesitate. She turns and bolts for the back door as the big guy roars with rage. Mike shoves me aside, yelling. That's my date! He's stumbling now, drunk, but he blunders after them into the darkness. I push past the gawking bar crowd and run outside. I can hear shouting, a scuffle in the darkness. I yell out. Mike, wait, it's not worth it! but he's already disappearing into the black desert night. Something hits the ground with a thud and Mike swears. He sounds far off now. My heart thuds in my chest. I know I should turn back, find a phone, try to get help. But something else compels me after them, some instinct I don't even try to understand. The desert air is cold, and the only light comes from the hazy outline of the moon. I'm following Mike's trail, scuff marks, a dropped beer bottle, as best I can, when I freeze. Up ahead, in a patch of moonlight, I see Kayla on the ground, pinned by that big brute. He's straddling her, one hand clamped over her mouth. The other's raised, and as I get closer I see that glint isn't a knife. It's a damn tire iron. My brain screams at me to run to hide. But there's this other part, some cold fury, that takes over. I don't even stop to think, 
just hurl myself into the fray with a yell that tears out of my throat. The guy whirls around, surprised, and heaves his weight off of Kayla. I crash into him, shoulder first, and we both go tumbling into the dirt, locked together. We wrestle, punches flying, the world a haze of dust and rage. He's strong, maybe been in fights before, but I'm fueled by something primal and desperate. I feel his hand clamp onto my shirt, hear the rip of fabric. Suddenly Kayla's there, not running like I'd expect, but kneeling beside us. I see the tire iron clutched in her hands, but she hesitates. Jason, get out of the way! Her voice is shaking, but determined. I manage a roll, scrambling away with a grunt. As the big guy lunges to his feet, Kayla swings. The crunch of metal on bone is sickening. His howl echoes into the desert night, and he staggers backwards, clutching his head. He doesn't go down, though, just sways there glaring at her, blood streaming between his fingers. Come on! Kayla screeches at me. She sounds terrified, but she's already turned and sprinting away into the darkness. On autopilot, I turn and follow. We run blindly, stumbling over rocks and the uneven ground. We don't dare look back. Only when we reach the bar parking lot does she finally slow down, her breath hitching with sobs. We both lean against her beat-up old car, gasping for air, too spent to speak. After a long silence, I manage to say, You okay? Kayla nods jerkily. In the faint moonlight, I can see her face is streaked with tears and dirt. Why, yeah, she says, wiping her eyes. Thanks. She starts to turn away, then pauses. Listen about Mike. My chest tightens. Don't. I interrupt, my voice rough. He made his choices. We don't know what happened out there. It's cowardly, maybe, but I can't handle any more tonight. She searches my face, and something like understanding passes between us. Then she nods again and climbs into her car. A moment later, the engine sputters to life, the old headlights cutting a path through the dust, and she's gone. The next morning, I get a visit from the local sheriff. He gives me the usual spiel about staying safe, not going out alone, especially not at night. I nod, go through the motions. And I say nothing about Mike, nothing about the girl named Kayla. Turns out, Mike shows back up eventually. Beat to hell, some broken ribs, claims he fell in a ditch fighting off a coyote or some wild story like that. He never goes back to that bar needless to say. Never speaks a word about that night. And neither do I. That's how you survive in places like that. You let some things stay buried. Years later, sometimes I see faces in the news that look a little too familiar, mugshot eyes that flash with that same dark hunger. Kayla's face, though, that haunts me in a different way. Often I wonder if she's okay if she found some place safe in the end. And at night, when I'm out on some lonely highway, and the desert stretches out on all sides like a black ocean, I think of her. And I wonder if the tire iron's still there somewhere in the sand, stained with rust and moonlight. Okay, so it was around 1980. I was just this kid, Travis, fresh out of high school and taking classes at the community college in San Bernardino. Just scraping by, living with my aunt, not a great situation, so when my buddies offered a road trip out to Vegas, I jumped at the chance. The three of us pile into Dave's beat-up Chevy van, Dave, me, and Rick, who was always up for anything. We're talking loud, cracking jokes, blasting music from the cassette deck, classic road trip vibe, right? 
Problem is, it gets late, and we don't want to spring for a motel. Figure we'll just pull off somewhere, sleep in the van, hit the road early. We find this spot off the highway, in the middle of nowhere. Pitch black out except for the stars. Feels kinda creepy, but I'm too tired to care. The guys pass out and back, and I grab a blanket to try and sleep in the front seat. I'm just dozing off when I hear it. A scratching sound. Like nails on metal. I sit up, my heart pounding, trying to see what it is. Moonlight glints off the side of the van, and there's this shape moving around in the shadows. A chill goes down my spine. It ain't no animal. I'd know that sound. A person, then? Maybe some homeless dude looking for a handout. Hey! I call out, my voice scratchy. Everything all right? The scratching stops. Dead silence. Even the crickets seem to have gone quiet. My skin's crawling. Then I see it. A figure steps out of the darkness. Tall guy, built like a linebacker. Just stands there staring at the van. Doesn't say a word. Suddenly, he lunges forward and slams his fist against the van's door. I can feel the whole thing shake. Let me in, he bellows. His voice is rough, slurred. He sounds drunk or crazy or both. I fumble with the lock. The guys in back finally stir, groggy and confused. What the hell's going on? Rick says. Just stay down. I shout back, my voice trembling. I hit the gas, the engine roars, and I slam the van into gear. The wheels spin in the dirt, spraying gravel, but finally we lurch forward. I keep checking the rearview mirror as we bump and jostle down this dirt track. The guy's running after us, yelling, but we're gaining distance. I push the van as fast as it'll go, the headlights barely cutting through the dark. Finally, we hit the main road again. I look back, but the guys disappeared. The adrenaline starts to wear off, replaced by a bone-deep chill. The guys are freaked out too, demanding an explanation. I don't know, man. I say, trying to keep my hands steady on the wheel. Just some nut job trying to scare us, I guess. But even as I say it, I don't believe it. There was something off about that guy, something, hungry. We drive straight through to Vegas. Nobody feels like sleeping now. Sun's coming up by the time we arrive, and the whole thing starts to feel like a weird nightmare. We gamble, drink, do our thing, and it's almost like it didn't happen. Almost, but not quite. That night, we're driving back home. Everyone's exhausted and it starts to rain. The headlights and the downpour make it hard to see. Suddenly, Dave slams on the brakes. The hell was that? He swears. There's a shape in the middle of the road, hunched over. I squint, my heart pounding again. As we get closer, I realize he's dragging something. Something long and heavy. Rick screams, a raw, terrified sound. It's him. It's that freaking guy. The figure looks up, right at us. He's grinning, a wild, inhuman grin. And in the dim light, I see what he's dragging. I see the bloody clothes, the tangled hair. It's a body. A girl's body. My brain screams at me to drive. To just get us the hell out of there. But I can't. I can't just leave her like that. The rain's coming down in sheets now, and for a second, I have this crazy thought about it washing the whole scene away, like some twisted baptism. Rick, I say, my voice tight. Stay in the van and lock the doors. No matter what, don't open up. He's pale, shaking. Travis, what are you gonna do? You can't. I don't wait for him to finish. I'm already stepping out into the downpour, 
the cold rain shocking me back to some kind of focus. The guy, he's just standing there, staring at us with that same feral smile. He doesn't even seem to notice the rain. I try to talk sense, even though I know it's useless. Look, man, whatever this is, we don't want any trouble. He laughs, the sound low and jagged. Sure, he drawls. No trouble at all. And then I see it, the glint of metal in his hand. A knife. I take a step back, raising my hands. Whoa, whoa, easy, okay? Inside the van, I can see Rick fumbling with something, and for a second, I get this flicker of hope. Maybe he got one of the tools from under the seat, something we can use to defend ourselves. But then the guy takes a step towards me, and I see his face up close, illuminated by the headlights. See the scars, the hollow eyes. The way his mouth twists when he smiles. This ain't some drunk or drug addict. This is something else. Something dangerous. That's when I notice the smell. Sickly sweet, like rotting meat. And something clicks into place. I remember news reports, whispers at gas stations along the highway. Girls gone missing, cars found abandoned on dusty desert roads. Some people say it's a trucker, someone who uses his route as a hunting ground. Others whisper darker things, but I always brushed it off, told myself they were just stories. And then it hits me, how else could he have taken her by surprise like that? in the middle of nowhere? This guy, he's the one they've been warning people about. He's the reason nobody drives these roads alone at night. My mind races. I could try to run, jump back in the van. But I know he'd catch me before I got even a few steps. And then what? He just hurt the guys too. I glance back at Rick. He's got the tire iron now holding it out the window like some kind of shield. No chance that would stop a man this determined. The guy with the knife takes another step closer. I can't do this. Can't just stand here. I reach out, the cold rain stinging my outstretched fingers, and grab what he's dragging. His eyes widen in surprise for a second, then he lets out a roar of fury. There's a struggle, a sickening ripping sound. I manage to pull free, and I'm stumbling back towards the van, dragging half the girl's body with me. The other half, he still has that, he's clutching it tight, a look of rage twisting his face. I fling open the van door and hurl myself inside, scrambling for the keys as the guy lunges forward. Dave slams the van into gear, tires screeching. We take off, leaving the man and his prize behind in a swirl of rain and mud. We don't stop until we hit the outskirts of a town with a lit-up gas station. We stumble inside, dragging the half-corpse with us, our clothes soaked with rain and blood. We call the cops, tell them what happened in a torrent of panic sobs and half-formed sentences. They find the other half of her a few days later, dumped in a ditch but they never catch the guy. For a while, we stick together, checking under cars and over our shoulders, convinced his face is gonna be lurking in every shadow. But time passes. One by one, we go back to our lives, try to forget the thing we saw out there. And sometimes, late at night, I can still hear that scratching sound from our first night on the road, like nails on metal. I still see the man's face, twisted in that hungry grin, standing beneath the desert stars. And I wonder, was he hunting us that first night? Or was it the other way around? The year was 1978 and I was living this crappy existence in a rundown Reno apartment. Back then I went by the name of Curtis. You wouldn't recognize me now, different name, different city, 
different life. But back then, I was just another lost soul. Work was some dead-end night shift at a gas station, and I was barely scraping by. You know the kind of night shift. Nothing to do but sit in that little booth under the fluorescent lights, watching drunks and strung-out weirdos stumble in and out. It made me feel like I was wasting away, like the hours were just leeching the life out of me. One night, dead slow as always, it seemed like I was about to just disappear into that vinyl chair. Then it started. A faint scratching sound, like something dragging along the wall outside, right where the window was. I dismissed it at first. Could be some critter, or a branch blowing in the wind. But it didn't stop. That scratching sound was persistent. Each time, a bit louder, a bit closer. I get up, try to peer out the grimy window. Can't see anything but blackness out in the parking lot. Then, there it is again, the scratching noise, and something flashes by the window too quick to catch a glimpse of. Whatever it was, it wasn't an animal. The noise, it sounded wrong. Too calculated. My heart was starting to pound a little faster. This was definitely getting weird. I pick up the phone under the counter, hand hovering over the nine and the one. But what the hell am I gonna say? Officer, there's something scratching my window. They'd probably hang up on me or just laugh. But what else could I do? Hey, I blurred out, my voice thick and unsteady when it finally does come out. Who's out there? Silence. My palms are getting sweaty on the cheap plastic of the phone. I hear my own breath, ragged and uneven, way too loud in the booth. Maybe I'd imagine the whole thing. Maybe it was just rats out behind the dumpster. But my gut tells me otherwise. The scratching starts up again, that rhythmic scrape, scrape, scrape. Then something bumps against the glass hard enough to make the whole booth shake. I'm gripping the phone like it's my lifeline and my brain is firing on all cylinders. I try to think through the haze of adrenaline-fueled panic. Okay, the back door is bolted shut but the emergency exit at the side, it's usually unlocked, but that goes to the alleyway, which ain't much better than the lot. Could someone be trying to get in? A robber? But it feels different. Something about this doesn't make sense. Those weren't the movements of just any desperate loser trying to break in. The scratching suddenly stops. In the deathly quiet, I swear I can make out a faint wheezing sound, like labored breathing. Then I see it. A hand pressed against the glass. Long, pale fingers with filthy, ragged nails. The hand shifts just enough for me to catch a glint of yellow in the dim light reflecting off the window. An eye, staring right back at me. That's when I panic. I smash the phone down on the hook so hard it cracks. I take off toward the back room, heart slamming against my ribs. The emergency exit isn't an option. The only way out is past that window and whatever is on the other side. My hands shake uselessly at the lock on the back door. It's rusted shut. I pound on it, shouting for help, knowing deep down that nobody is coming. And then I hear it behind me, the faint scraping and shuffling getting closer. The sound of claws on concrete. I turn around, my whole body trembling, ready to see some hideous monster tear its way through the window. But nothing dead silence. No sign of anything outside. The fluorescent lights hum above me, mocking me with their normalcy. That's almost worse than seeing the damn thing. My mind is spinning, trying to process what the hell just happened. Did it leave? Was it all some sick hallucination? Before I can even decide what to do, the scraping starts again. This time it's at the back door, frantic and relentless, like something trying to claw its way in. 
My stomach lurches. I'm trapped in this little box, no way out, and whatever is out there knows it. I tried to calm my breathing, my mind racing. Think, Curtis, think. The cash register. There's maybe a couple of hundred bucks in it. Is that why the thing was out there? If I toss the money out, will it just go away? It feels stupid desperate, but right then my life doesn't seem worth more than a few bills. I creep toward the front of the store, barely daring to look at the window, afraid I'll see that hand clawing at the glass again. I slide the register drawer open, grab the stack of cash, and shove it through the little drop slot in the booth window. Silence again. I wait, holding my breath, my body tense like a coiled spring. Then, finally, footsteps. Soft, receding footsteps moving into the darkness of the parking lot. I sink down on that awful vinyl chair, a mix of relief and absolute dread washing over me. I don't remember the rest of that night too clearly. I think I stayed curled up in the back room until dawn, shaking uncontrollably. When the sun finally came up, I took one last look around and got the hell out of there. I never even filed a report. Who would believe me? I packed up my meager belongings and disappeared. Changed my name, my look, everything. I couldn't shake the feeling that whatever the hell was out there that night, it might still be looking for me. Back around 1982, I lived in a rural area just outside of Casper, Wyoming. My name's Cody, and back then, I was just a kid trying to survive in a tough situation. Living with my pops after my mom left wasn't easy. He wasn't the greatest guy, let's just say that. Anyway, things were already bad enough, but that summer, they took a turn for the worse. It all started with the livestock turning up dead. Mutilated. We lost a couple of calves, their carcasses torn open with a precision that seemed unnatural. Pops blamed coyotes or something at first, but the way the bodies were left, well, it sent a shiver down my spine. And that was just the beginning. A few weeks later, old Jim Holden from down the road went missing. Now, Jim was a bit of an oddball, lived alone and kept to himself, but he was harmless. His disappearance sent a ripple of worry through the community. Search parties turned up nothing, as if he'd just vanished. Pops, always the conspiracy nut, started muttering about aliens or government experiments. Me? I didn't know what to think, but fear not at my gut. The town got that quiet you always hear about in horror movies. You know, the one where the chirping crickets seem louder than they should be, and shadows stretch long in the twilight as though reaching out for you. Everyone walked with a wary eye, casting glances over their shoulder. I couldn't shake the feeling I was being watched. One night, I was out by the barn doing chores when a rancid smell hit me. It made my stomach turn. Following the stench, I came across a sight that still gives me nightmares. Three of our sheep lay gutted under the faint moonlight, their insides spilled out like some grotesque offering. I stumbled back, gagging. Something ain't right. Something ain't right. The thought beat through my head like a war drum. That's when I saw him. At first, I thought my eyes were playing tricks on me. A tall figure moved amongst the trees on the edge of our property. Too tall. Too lanky. The silhouette was all wrong, like a man stretched and elongated. As he turned slightly, I caught a glimpse of his face in the moonlight. It was gaunt, eyes sunken and gleaming with a predatory hunger. I froze. Adrenaline surged through my veins as he slowly turned his head. He'd spotted me. My first instinct was to run, but my feet felt rooted to the spot. 
the thing, the man, whatever it was, started walking towards me. Not a run, but a brisk, unsettling stride, like it knew it had all the time in the world. Pop's shotgun was inside the house. Way too far. My throat was sandpaper dry, and I knew screaming would be useless out here. In a flash of desperation, I grabbed a rusty pitchfork near the fence. It was flimsy, but it was better than nothing. The figure kept approaching, his pace steady. He was maybe twenty yards away when I realized he held something in his hand. It glinted in the moonlight, and a wave of nausea washed over me. It was one of our cow's legs, severed clean at the hip. That snapped me out of my frozen stupor. I lunged forward, screaming in a mix of fear and defiance. I jabbed the pitchfork wildly at the figure, but he dodged with impossible ease. His movements were too fast, almost inhuman. I stumbled back as he raised the cow leg like a club. I closed my eyes, expecting the crushing blow. I heard a grunt, not the terrified sound I was expecting, but something deeper, guttural. Then the sound of heavy footsteps retreating into the darkness. When I dared to open my eyes, the creature was gone. I don't remember much after that. Shaking, I ran back to the house and fumbled with the lock. Bursting inside, I slammed the door shut and bolted it, my heart pounding against my ribs. My pops, roused by the commotion, was bleary-eyed and confused, but when I told him what I saw, his face paled. He grabbed his shotgun and checked the perimeter, muttering curses under his breath. We didn't find anything, but neither of us slept that night. The next few days passed in a blur of shotguns and sleepless nights. I knew whatever that thing was, it was still out there, watching, waiting. The folks in town were even more spooked than before. The sheriff organized a larger search party, but just like with Jim, they found nothing. It was like the creature had vanished into thin air. Finally, it was more than Pops and I could take. The stress, the constant fear, the feeling that we were prey, it broke us. We packed what we could carry, abandoned the farm, and drove away, never looking back. We drifted for a while, staying in cheap motels and never settling down for long. I never saw the creature again, but I feel his eyes on me even now. The memory of that gaunt face and those cold, hungry eyes haunts me to this day. Nineteen seventy seven, and I'm living alone on a dusty farm outside Midland, Texas. The farmhouse is old, creaky, and I'm no good with tools, so the isolation started feeling real oppressive after a while. My name's Curtis, by the way. One day I decided to tackle some of the repairs piling up, starting with the broken latch on the basement door. I swear that basement always gave me the creeps. It was half-flooded, the kind of damp that just seeps into your bones. Heaving the door open was a workout in itself, but that musty, rusted metal smell was something else. It hit me like a physical wave, making me gag. Squinting in the dim light, I took the steps down slowly. Cobwebs clung to everything, making the narrow space claustrophobic. I was nearly to the bottom when something clattered. It sounded like it came from further inside, an empty drum rolling across the concrete floor. My heart lurched, and my first thought was rats. Big, nasty ones. But rats wouldn't explain that rusty smell. Swallowing my fear, I crept deeper into the room. Visibility was terrible the only light being the weak sunbeam through the open door behind me. The air felt heavy, saturated with something foul. Then I saw it. Not the drum. Not a rat. Not anything I could easily name. 
I was looking at a heap of clothes. Just a pile of what looked like coveralls, stained dark and stiff with something that might have been dirt. Or, I inch closer, the rotten stink nearly overpowering me. My flashlight beam caught a flash of metal near the pile. A big wrench, crusted with something dark brown. Panic flooded me. I should have run then, sprinted back up those stairs. But morbid fascination kept me rooted. I had to know. Using the wrench like a poker, I nudged a mound of filthy cloth. As it unfurled, something flopped out and thudded onto the damp concrete. It was a sun-bleached human skull. I recoiled, stumbled, and nearly fell. Scrambling backwards, I smashed my head on the basement wall. Darkness rimmed my vision. Staggering to my feet, I bolted toward the steps. The stench was smothering, almost metallic now. Something was moving behind me, the shuffle and scrape of clothes across cement. I fumbled for the doorknob above, hearing that shuffling sound grow closer. Something brushed against my back, stiff, unyielding, freezing cold. With a surge of adrenaline, I ripped the door open. Blinded by the sudden sunlight, I tore out into the yard, slamming the door behind me. Gasping for breath, I turned, braced to see whatever nightmare lurked on the other side. Nothing. Just the empty expanse of the farm. Shaking, I found my hammer. Then, ignoring the tremor in my hands, I nailed that damn basement door shut. It wasn't the smartest plan. I should have gone to the cops or found somewhere else to stay. But I was terrified and ashamed and figured there had to be some logical explanation for what I saw down there. After a few days, the smell started seeping up through the floorboards. That rotten meat stench impossible to ignore. Flies began to gather, a relentless buzzing swarm at the basement door. But I still didn't call the cops. I was young, too stubborn to admit I needed help. It was about a week later when I heard the noises upstairs. Not creaks or groans like the wind, but movement. Slow, measured footsteps. Someone, or something, was up there. This time, I didn't hesitate. I sprinted to my truck and tore off down the dirt road toward town. It wasn't until I was halfway to Midland that it hit me. I hadn't locked the front door. I can still picture that dusty farmhouse, bathed in harsh West Texas sun, as I sped away. I never looked back. Midland police searched the place, said they didn't find any trace of what I described. I still get letters from the new owners, asking if they can excavate under the house. They say they keep finding things. I haven't gone back, and I never will. But sometimes, late at night, I imagine footsteps echoing through my own house. Slow, purposeful. And I hear that shuffling sound, the scrape of old clothes on the floor. Then, it's like I can smell it again, that rusted metal stench. It was back in 79, when I was still a teenager living outside Phoenix, Arizona. Name's Wyatt. Things with my old man weren't the best, so Summers the first usually stayed with my aunt. She had a little trailer on a patch of desert out on the outskirts of town, an escape, at least for a while. You know that desert stillness when the sun goes down? There's an unnatural quiet like the whole world is holding its breath. That's the thing about places like that, though. There's always the feeling something else could be out there with you. One evening, I was helping my aunt with some chores when she got the news old Harlan Tucker, who owned a small ranch down the road, had gone missing. Search party was heading out at dawn. Seemed odd. Harlan was the type to keep to himself, but you wouldn't call him a hermit. 
I'd see him in town once in a while. I told my aunt I'd help out. Something about it just bothered me. The next morning, we were a ragtag group, a few deputies, some ranchers who knew the land, and folks like me, just worried and wanting to help. We spread out, combing the dry gullies and creosote flats, the sun already beating down on us. By mid-afternoon, it felt like we'd been searching forever and found nothing. Frustration was brewing among the men. I was starting to get a bad feeling, a tightness in my chest that didn't make sense. Then, one of the searchers yelled out. Everyone rushed over. That's when I saw it. Harlan, or what was left of him. His body was sprawled out under a scraggly palo verde, torn open in a way that made your stomach turn. There was this smell, coppery and sweet mixed with decay. It still makes me gag to think of it. The deputies were all business, radioing for backup and sending someone back to get the coroner. The rest of us just stood there, a mix of horror and disbelief on our faces. Even the toughest ranchers looked shaken. This wasn't a mountain lion or some other predator. Whatever did this was calculating. One of the deputies noticed some odd markings near the remains. Deep, parallel gouges in the hard desert soil that didn't make any sense. They looked deliberate, almost ritualistic. That's when I felt the first prickle of real fear on the back of my neck. This wasn't just some animal attack. It wasn't an accident. There was something out here with us. We were still reeling when the sun began to sink in the sky. The deputies made the call. We'd break the search until morning. It was too dangerous to be out here at night. As we started back, I took a long look around the desert. The shadows stretched out, and everything felt too big, too empty. There was no way I was sleeping easy that night. Back at my aunt's place, I tried to eat, but it was useless. I kept hearing every creak and rustle, visualizing that awful scene again and again. My aunt tried to reassure me that whatever did that to Harlan was likely long gone, but I wasn't so sure. I felt watched. Just past midnight, my aunt's two mangy dogs started barking like crazy. They usually went nuts over any critter in the yard, but this was different. This was a frenzy. I peered out the window, trying to see anything in the silvery moonlight. Then I froze. Standing on the edge of the property was a figure. Tall and impossibly thin, it cast a long distorted shadow. I gasped, but I couldn't make out any features, just a stark silhouette against the dim light. Then those dogs charged towards the figure, their snarls echoing through the night. What happened next haunts me to this day. I watched in horror as the figure moved with unnatural speed, its arms blurring in the darkness. The dog's yelps were cut short with sickening thuds, followed by the sound of tearing flesh and crunching bone. It was over in a flash, that awful silence settling over the desert once more. I was rooted to the spot, an icy sweat breaking out over me. That thing had moved too fast to be human. My hands shook as I grabbed one of my aunt's old shotguns and shoved shells into the chamber, keeping my eyes glued to the edge of the yard. I stayed up the rest of that night, huddled near the window, the shotgun within reach. I never saw that figure again, but the image of it is seared into my brain. By sunrise, deputies were swarming the area. They found what was left of my aunt's dogs, confirming what I already knew, that thing wasn't some wild animal. We searched every inch of the desert, but found no sign, no clue of what it was and where it could have gone. Harlan's death was never officially solved. Some of the ranchers whispered about a drifter who'd been seen in the area, a strange fellow said to have unsettling eyes, but talk died down and life, I guess, went on. I left soon after, hitching rides back home. 
My aunt sold the trailer. Didn't want to be out there alone anymore. I can't blame her. Me, I never really settled down after that. You become wary after something like that, always looking over your shoulder, waiting for that sliver of a shadow that doesn't belong. It was 1978, and I was stuck in this dreary little motel in the middle of nowhere, Oklahoma. Honestly, the only reason I booked it was the cheap rate and the fact it was on my way west. I'm Clark, by the way. Just your average traveling salesman, nothing special. But back then, being on the road meant more nights in crummy motels than your own bed. This particular motel gave me the creeps from the moment I pulled in. You know the kind, faded sign flickering, paint peeling off every surface, and that weird, stale smell that seeps into your bones. My room wasn't much better. I'm talking thin carpet with dubious stains, a flickering lamp, and a window overlooking a deserted stretch of highway. Safe to say... I was eager to crash and get out of there at first light. But sleep was a long time coming. Every tiny creek had me on high alert. The flickering lamp didn't help either, throwing ominous shadows all over the room. I tossed and turned, trying to convince myself it was just my tired mind playing tricks. Then I heard it. A thud. One single soft thud from somewhere above my room. It made my stomach clench. It wasn't the wind. I'd been around enough cheap motels to know that sound. This was something, or someone, moving around in the attic space. For a second I froze. Then I told myself I was being stupid. Probably just a raccoon or something harmless, scurrying around in the rafters. But something about it just felt wrong. There was something deliberate about that thud, almost rhythmic. I forced myself to get up, heart pounding. If I could just take a quick peek up there, maybe I could put my mind at ease and finally get some sleep. I crept over to the door, trying not to breathe too loudly. The motel's layout was one of those old-school designs with a narrow exterior walkway. A flimsy-looking ladder led up to a small hatch at the end. My rational mind screamed at me to go back to bed and ignore it. But curiosity always wins, right? Bad decision, Clark. Bad decision. Before I knew it, I was climbing the ladder, each creaking metal rung sending chills down my spine. The night air was surprisingly cold, making me shiver. Reaching the top, I hesitated. The hatch was old and rusty, with peeling paint. With trembling hands, I nudged it open. The rusty hinges squealed in protest, and I winced. Way to be stealthy, genius. The attic space was a black void, the only light coming from the sliver of the open hatch. My eyes strained to adjust. Musty air filled my nostrils, thick with dust and a hint of something rotten. My skin crawled. I should have gone back down right then. But the thud, it came again, closer this time driven by a strange mix of fear and morbid fascination. I took a step into the abyss. The floorboards beneath me groaned ominously. I fumbled for my pocket flashlight, flicking it on. The weak beam cut through the darkness, revealing what looked like stacks of dusty boxes and old furniture. That's when I saw it. A pair of eyes reflecting the flashlight beam. They were low to the ground, unblinking, and burning with a cold intensity that sent a jolt of pure terror through me. I froze, the flashlight shaking in my hand. I didn't see a whole body, just those eyes gleaming back at me, like a predator sizing up its prey. A strangled gasp escaped my lips. I stumbled backward, my foot snagging on something unseen. I fell hard, the flashlight skittering out of my hand. 
darkness engulfed me, punctuated only by those malevolent eyes. Pure adrenaline surged through me. Scrambling on my hands and knees, I desperately groped for the flashlight. My fingers brushed against something cold and wet. Recoiling in horror, I realized it was a pool of some sticky liquid, blood, my panicked brain screamed. The eyes had disappeared. I was alone in that pitch-black space with the stench of blood and the lingering echo of a heavy thud. I don't know how, but I found my flashlight, flicking it on frantically. As my eyes darted around, a sickening sight awaited me. There, in the feeble circle of light, was a hand. A severed hand, pale and lifeless, lying grotesquely in a pool of its own blood. Nausea clawed at my throat. I stumbled towards the hatch, a scream building in my chest but never quite reaching my lips. My scramble down the ladder was a blur. Every rung felt like it would give way, sending me tumbling into the darkness. Heart pounding in my ears, I threw myself back into my room, slamming the door shut and fumbling for the lock. Hands shaking violently, I forced myself to breathe. Think, Clark, think. Called the cops? I grabbed the phone, fingers clumsy as I dialed 911. As the line rang, my mind raced. What would I tell them? Some maniac in the attic? A severed hand? They'd think I was crazy. Probably lock me up instead. I hung up, panic flooding back. What else could I do? I wasn't sticking around to find out. Stuffing essentials into my bag, I took a deep breath and opened the door, wincing at the creek. Peeking out, I saw nothing but the dim stretch of the walkway. The night had grown unsettlingly quiet. Every shadow seemed to shift and lengthen, playing tricks on my eyes. I took a hesitant step out, then another. My car, blessed normality, was just a few doors down. I broke into a jog, keys clenched in my fists like a weapon. As I fumbled with the lock, I heard it, a rustling sound from behind. I spun around. There, silhouetted against the motel's dim lights, was a figure. Tall and broad-shouldered, he was just standing there, watching. Hey! What do you want? I yelled, my voice cracking. He didn't answer, just kept staring his presence a black hole sucking all the air out of the night. I didn't wait for him to make a move. Diving into the car, I slammed the door and locked it. My hands, shaking uncontrollably, struggled with the ignition. The engine coughed and roared to life. I threw the car into reverse, screeching out of that desolate parking lot. Glancing in the rearview mirror, I caught a glimpse of the figure still standing there, unmoving. A chill settled deep in my bones. Who was he? Was he the one with those eyes in the attic? What horrors was he hiding up there? I drove all night, finally stopping at a truck stop diner as dawn was breaking. I ordered a coffee, black and strong, and tried to wrap my mind around what had happened. A part of me wanted to go to the police, report what I'd seen, but a darker part whispered that getting involved would mean stepping back into that world of shadows and severed hands. Days turned into weeks. I tried to bury the memory, to push it down into that box of things better left forgotten. But that night, those eyes, the hand, it haunted my dreams. Every time the phone rang, I jumped. Every shadow in a darkened room made my heart pound in my chest. News reports from back in Oklahoma were unsettling. A few articles mentioned a missing man, last seen around that stretch of highway. The description was vague, the details scant. No mention of foul play, just an unsolved disappearance, another face lost in time. I couldn't help but wonder— was the missing man connected to what I saw in that attic? Had he been a victim? 
Or had he been the predator? I'll probably never know. That crummy motel faded out of my rearview mirror, but the memory of that night never truly left me. I learned that sometimes, the most terrifying things lie hidden in plain sight, just beneath the surface of our normal, everyday lives. I still catch myself looking over my shoulder sometimes, especially in dingy motels or dark attics. I guess the guy in that attic, maybe he was some drifter, some psychopath passing through. Or maybe, just maybe, he was something else entirely. Maybe he's still out there, lurking in those forgotten corners, his eyes gleaming in the dark.